the fact was, if you had asked me when I was 15, what am I doing at school? I may well have said, I'm here to get some qualifications, but to do what with them? Because no one explained to me that the way how this society, not just this society, because I know it speaks to the position and the condition of people in the U.S. as well. It's structured in layers. So to go from, or levels, let's say, to go from one level to another, you need a piece of paper. From the day you're born in these societies, you have a piece of paper. It can be your birth certificate, whatever. But there is always these pieces of paper. Now, no one explained to me, which is what I explained to these young people, when you're in secondary school, you are compelled to be educated from the age of five to the age of 16. It's compulsory. Even if you withdraw your children and educate them at home, it's still compulsory. For those 11 years of your life, I think it would be in your best interest to leave that school with the pieces of paper you need that will guarantee you can go to the next level. The next level may be into employment, or it may be to go to college, which will then take you to university. For many of the young people, they don't make that link. They think that they are almost guaranteed a place at college, or they, if, if they're thinking about going to college or thinking about going to university, it's almost like there is this unrealistic idea that they can achieve those things without having those pieces of paper in place. So the emphasis for me is put on those pieces of paper and what they say at the end of each particular leg of your journey. However, what happens to a lot of the African Caribbean children or black children is they have this, or a lot of um, African-centered scholars or African-centered activists have this idea that all aspects of African history should be if, if, as if you could teach all aspects of African history. But as if these aspects of African history are the main reason why these young people are achieving because they don't see themselves represented positively within that which they are being instructed. I don't necessarily go along with that. I think that young people should know exactly what it is they're doing in school. Now, if you're sent to school in a white-dominated society, in a society that is inherently racist, classist, and sexist, a society where you know that you can watch the TV on any of the main TV channels and you will not see yourself positively represented on there unless you happen to be white, for me, you need to go to school with that vision, that view, that lens, so that you know that what you are being taught is for a particular purpose. And the purpose is this piece of paper with these qualifications. There's something that, that Ellison himself um, wrote about the structure of this. I mean, I've, he, and we've I've sort of alluded to the form. Um, he says, uh, uh, he, uh, an interviewer is asking El Ralph Ellison, did you have everything thought out before you began to write Invisible Man? And Ellison says, the symbols and their connections were known to me. I began it with a chart of a three-part division. It was a conceptual frame with most of the ideas and some of the incidents indicated. The three parts represent the narrator's movement from purpose to passion to perception. So again, there's that idea of, of the victory of conscious perception, that it's from purpose to passion to perception. It's the three parts to it. Um, these three major sections are built of smaller units of three, which mark the course of the action and which depend for their development upon what I hoped was a consistent and developing motivation. And I'll say, you know, when I read the book, I didn't immediately see that it was a three-part structure, that each of those three parts had another three parts to it. But, I mean, it, it really speaks to the completeness of Ellison's vision, that each part uh, links to the next part. Um, it, I think the experience is one very much of consistent developing motivation, but it's just so beautifully fulfilled in this perfectly symmetrical form that he conceived. Um, he says, you'll note that the maximum insight on the hero's part isn't reached until the final section. After all, it's, about, it's a novel about innocence and human error, a struggle through illusion to reality. 
Each section begins with a sheet of paper. Each piece of paper is exchanged for another and contains a definition of his identity or the social role he is to play as defined for him by others. But all say essentially the same thing. Keep this boy running. Before he could have some voice in his own destiny, he had to discard these old identities and illusions. His enlightenment couldn't come until then. Once he recognizes the hole of darkness into which these papers put him, he has to burn them. That's the plan and the attention. Uh, and I just think that that's such a beautiful kind of snapshot of the whole experience. Um, you know, again, I didn't, I didn't get it, you know, just reading the book, like, but it was just such a powerful thing for me when I read that quote. I said, wow, he really structured it so that every, every part of the novel begins and ends with a piece of paper that is exchanged for another. And each one of these pieces of paper is about giving, trying to give the invisible man uh, a, an identity other than his true human identity. And the culmination is in the burning uh, of all of those papers. But it's also the culmination is then in the writing of this book. This book is from beginning to end about the power of words, about the power of written words and printed words, uh, about the power of various scripts. And uh, what Ellison finally asserts, uh, he's got a character that is driven from beginning to the end of the book by these pieces of paper that are being handed to him. Uh, and finally, he burns them in, in exchange for them or uh, in, as a replacement for him. He's going to assert himself as an author and produce his own written words. Um, and I just think that that's such a, a powerful fulfillment of the whole structure of, of the experience here. Um, uh, and I just, it just kind of gave me a different uh, appreciation for it to, to know that that, uh, that that is how he conceived of it. Um, uh, he does very clearly signal that the importance of that when he sort of, at the, near the end of the book, he does give you the inventory of all of those people, pieces of paper, and gives you the retrospective of what they have meant. But anyhow, I think it's, it's more powerful if you've worked your way through and you get to that and you can and see uh, how it all has fit together and how uh, one sort of great victory of perception is going to see through all the consistency of what has driven him throughout the book. I should say that 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 was uh, the interview was in called the art of the art of fiction. Um, when he's writing, he's sort of uh, talking about what he thinks novels can achieve, and that's that's his intention for the book. Woo! Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade Justice in for another program. Uh, hopefully to share constructive information. Uh, my switchboard at TalkShoe is uh, not acting correctly. Hopefully that will be rectified shortly and I will be able to get to uh, the switchboard and see folks that called in. But if you dial in, just hang tight and uh, hopefully I'll get that problem corrected. Um, Want to hop right to it. The two voices that you heard, uh, Dr. William Les Henry, a uh, black male from the United Kingdom, uh, he's the author of Whiteness Made Simple. He was a guest on the program in March of 2011. Uh, the second voice, uh, Dr. Martin Kvorkian, uh, professor at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, author of Color Monitors, The Black Face of Technology in America. Uh, Dr. Kvorkian, also an admitted racist, uh, admitted that on the program uh, almost a year, excuse me, almost two years to the day that he admitted that on the program, May 2nd, 2009. Uh, Dr. Kvorkian's work, uh, as he has referenced repeatedly, Invisible Man, had a huge impact um, on his theory and what he has talked about on this program repeatedly. Uh, he's been a guest with us uh, many times, but the segment that you heard uh, was from August 2010. Uh, that particular program, we uh, discussed Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, uh, which I think, you know, one of my top five favorite of all time uh, books. And uh, Dr. Kevorkian was with us again uh, in January of this year. We were not talking about Invisible Man, but the book came up. <laughs> um, just, you know, so many, so many things uh, reference or allude to various aspects of this book. And when he was here in January, Invisible Man came up, and uh, it came up several times. And during the course of the discussion, he referenced our guest for today's program. Uh, and he talked about, you know, how great 
uh, her essay and, and her work on Ellison, uh, how great her work is, and uh, suggested that we might maybe try to see if we can get her on the program. Uh, I checked out her work, um, sent her a program of Dr. Nell Irvin Painter, and she said she would be down to come and chat with us. Um, I learned more reading uh, her report on Ellison, uh, uh, reading her report and then going to read Invisible Man again, um, really helped me overstand what I think he was attempting to say in the book and uh, how that, I mean, it just, it reveals so much, um, so, so much about the system of white supremacy and how it works. And I hope that'll come through in the program. Uh, our guest, he is in the Department of English at the University of Iowa. Uh, her focus is on 20th century African-American literature and visual media. Uh, she co-authored uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, A Reference Guide, and uh, she has a fantastic report. Uh, it's titled The Visual Art of Invisible Man, Ellison's Portrait of Blackness. Uh, we'll be talking about the, that today as well as... Uh, of course, Invisible Man. Real pleasure to have her on the program, and uh, thank you to Ralph Ellison. Uh, if it wasn't for him, we probably would not have met uh, brilliant and gorgeous uh, Professor Lena Hill. Uh, Professor Hill, are you with us? I am, and thank you for that introduction and for having me on the program. Gus, I just feel honored to be here and have a chance to discuss one of my favorite novels um, as well as my work, so I just want to thank you for that. Pleasure is ours. Pleasure is ours. Um, before we get started, uh, is there anything you would like to share with listeners that you think, you know, it's important that they should know before we hop into uh, Ellison and your work? Well, I think that the introductory um, recordings that you began with really set, um, set the groundwork for, for a great discussion. I love the way um, both Dr. Henry and Dr. Kaporkian focus on the paper trail within the novel. And I think that's a, a great place to start, both from the perspective of Ellison's investment in the work of the fiction writer. Um, he felt there was something significant that one could contribute to discussions of race, to discussions of politics, to discussions of what this country should be um, that the creative writer could do. Um, so he both gives us a protagonist that is working towards becoming a writer, but at the same time, for me, I'm very invested in the need for the protagonist not only to write, but first to see his position in this country. Um, so, so in many ways, I'm excited to begin with, with that, that entry into the novel. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm definitely going to come back to that sound clip because I've been waiting about a month, a little more than a month to play that sound clip um, together, but I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, before, before we hop in uh, this program, context of white supremacy, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy. I uh, use those terms as synonyms. I have the same definition for both terms, racism and white supremacy. Uh, that definition is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists and do you think that definition is accurate? Well, I definitely agree that there are systems that keep certain people from positions of power uh, throughout the world. I think, though, I'm going to sort of deflect and, and, and in some ways turn to Ellison's words because as I've worked on him, in many ways my own regard for racial relations in this country um, have been molded and I would say uh, strongly impacted by his view. And Ellison felt that in many ways, while, yes, power structures are dependent upon race and a, a history in which certain groups have had more power based on an amassment of material wealth um, and other kinds of, of military um, subjugation that they have uh, used in order to maintain a position of power. But for Ellison, I think he really wants to focus on, and, and, and I tend to focus on when I think of racial relations, 
how the acquisition of knowledge um, has been one way that certain groups have been able to dominate other groups. So both for his protagonist and when Ellison looks out into the landscape of racial relations, particularly in this country, but as your definition goes beyond to think about a global system, and I think Ellison would think um, this worked in looking beyond uh, the, the borders of this country as well, um, he would advocate a need for people of all ethnic groups, who those we might classify as other non-white um, folks, to actually concentrate on amassing greater access to knowledge, institutions that dispense knowledge, um, understanding one's place in society. And so that while, yes, there, there is definitely um, a racism that in many ways colors interactions uh, between people and determines certain aspects of our lives, I think he would, um, and I would, I should say, uh, possibly hedge on, on, on suggesting that at this point in 2011, we still um, think of the system in the, in the very blatant terms <laughs> that you just articulated. Wow. Uh, this will be a great broadcast. Um, <laughs> wow. This is going to be a great broadcast. I'm going to have lots of fun. Um, and I, and it'll be great because we'll be taking kind of different positions because it seems like Professor Hill is saying that, you know, Gus, that, that might be a bit much in 2011 to say that. Uh, Gus would say, I will grab the same book that she's going to reference and say, man, Ralph Ellison would say, Gus, I think you're correct. Even if he doesn't say it, his book's <laughs> volume would say, Gus, you are on the money all day, every page, every sentence. Um yeah, so this will be great. And in right. fact, reading your work helped me see, whoa, Ralph Ellison is saying exactly what I'm saying about white people and the system of white supremacy. Every page, he's saying exactly what I'm saying. It's different words, may, and sometimes it's real explicit <laughs> saying what I'm saying. But we'll get, we'll get to that. At any rate, um, and you are a black female for folks who have not seen, correct? I am, and I want to also say that in addition to being in the English department, I also have an appointment in African American Studies, which has a very long and rich history at the University of Iowa. So I'm very proud to be both in the English department as well as the department uh, or the program of African American Studies. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, the, someone did write in the chat room. Thank you. They said your volume is a little low, so if you could speak up for us, uh, Professor okay. Hill, we appreciate okay, it. Um, I wanted to go back to the, the introduction because that took up a lot of time just to make sure that m listeners understand why I felt that that was an important way to begin the dialogue with your work in Ellison. Um, Dr. Les, the, the first gentleman that was speaking, he wasn't talking about Ellison's book. Uh, he was just, you know, sharing his thoughts on education and saying that it's important to get those pieces of paper so that you can get to the next level. And I think he explained in the clip why. Um, he was on the program March 2011. The, the second clip from Dr. Kevorkian was from August 2010. Uh, when I heard Dr. Les making those statements about the need for black people to get those pieces of paper so that they could move on in a system of white domination, Dr. K it was like bullet time from the Matrix. It was like everything <laughs> slowed down and I could hear each syllable as he was coming out. I was thinking, oh, my gosh, that is Ralph Ellison. <laughs> like, uh, I, it was a, immediately as soon as he said the word paper, I was like, that's going to be a sound clip. And I have been waiting a month to play it. Um, do I mean, if you could just share your view, uh, am I talking crazy or would Ellison support what I'm saying that, wow, when you hear someone saying black people, what you need to do in a system of white domination is get pieces of paper to move to the next level. Should if you are familiar with Ellison's work, should you cringe, Professor Hill? I don't think you should cringe, but I do think it's it, 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 the reason I love that clip is because I think Ellison would have a good laugh. And this is why Ellison would agree, and, and this is what his hero is invested in, is in gaining these pieces of paper um, that forces of power in the society in which he wants to be successful in have attached a certain, um, a certain importance to, right? So the hero from the very moment that the text begins 
is trying to amass these pieces of paper that will legitimate him within this society. Um, however, Ellison's point, and I think we get to this in the second clip, um, in having the protagonist burn those pieces of paper, is that you are mistaken when you put too much um, and when you invest too much in these pieces of paper without understanding what they represent. And this is what Dr. Les was saying, that it's really incumbent upon uh, African Americans, Africans, various ethnic groups to both get these pieces of paper, but to understand the system that's awarding them. Now, what undergirds uh, the, the, the kind of rationale from Ellison's point of view is the country is founded upon certain pieces of paper. Now, this is what gets Ellison in trouble with the black uh, arts movement uh, writers of the 1970s, who really rejected Ellison, didn't feel he was polemical enough, didn't feel he was ardent or strident enough um, in, in, in fighting for African Americans at this moment. Remember, Alice, Ellison publishes this text in 1952, before the Civil Rights Movement, before the black arts movement. Um, and when those movements burst upon the scene, he is not an active player in the way you might imagine. One reason is because although he has profound problems with certain aspects of American society, he actually is, in, in some ways, a surprising uh, patriot, meaning that he believes that the country is founded upon some important ideals that we do not realize. Okay, So the invisible man in his text invest a certain belief in these pieces of paper without understanding their true significance. And at the very end, in the epilogue, he finally comes to terms with the fact that he's allowed the pieces of paper to define him instead of understanding the pieces of paper and using them to formulate a richer sense of his own identity, his own African-American identity. Hmm. Wow. Um, and again, um, I, I've read this book many times. Um, I think I don't even remember how many times I've read. I think I've read it for. And I suspect Professor Hill uh, has probably read this book many times as well. Uh, more than five times, yes. Professor Hill. Oh, my gosh. I just finished teaching it. Um, well, actually, I haven't finished teaching my undergraduates. I just wrapped up. Um, teaching this text with my graduate course last week, and I'm moving on to three days before the shooting, the, his, his unfinished second novel. Um, I, I really can't tell you how many times I've read this text. It would be I, I've been working on it for over ten years now, so I'm not I'm not sure how many times I've read it at this point. Mm. Mm. Uh, okay. Well. Given that, uh, where I'm going to go, page 33, uh, my comments about the paper and about the system of white supremacy, um, I just want to read this and get your thoughts in. If you could tie it to how it relates to the uh, introduction, that would be fabulous. Uh, okay. This is page 33, uh, right after the Battle Royal has concluded. I hope people have read Invisible. If, you, if you're listening to this program, if you're a black person, Please read Invisible Man. This program will mean a lot more to you and the previous broadcast when Dr. Kevorkian and I discussed this work. It'll mean a lot more to you. Anyone out there, if you're confused about the cowbell, listen to this program, read the book, you'll overstand it. Okay, this is page, uh, this is page 33. Battle Royal has just concluded. Uh, our main character has got his briefcase, first piece of paper, and uh, this is his conversation. He's, he's talking uh, with himself and the audience. He, said, he writes, this is Ellison, that night I dreamed I was at a circus with grandfather and that he refused to laugh at the clowns no matter what they did. Then later he told me to open my briefcase and read what was inside, and I did, finding an official envelope stamped with the state seal. And inside the envelope, I found another and another endlessly. And I thought I would fall of weariness. Them's years, he said. Now open that one. And I did. And in it, I found an engraved document containing a short message in letters of gold. Read it, my grandfather said out loud to whom it may concern i intoned keep this nigger boy running 
I awoke with the old man's laughter ringing in my ears. Incredible passage. This is chapter one, chapter one. And grandfather, even though grandfather has already died at this point, these words haunt our main character for the remainder of the book. Your thoughts, Professor Hill? Yes, and I have to say I'm just waiting for the opportunity to use overstand, to add that to my vocabulary. Um, this is an important moment, and the grandfather and his advice, you're right, exactly in those words, haunt uh, the protagonist throughout the text. And this in particular, um, it just sort of highlights the protagonist's inability, his very dramatic failure to understand his grandfather's words and to understand the import of these pieces of paper. And this is the first of many. He's going to continue to collect these pieces of paper. Now, the, the, this exact, those words, keep this nigger boy running. What does it mean? What's going to keep him running? I think what we're meant to understand here is that what's going to keep him running is his failure to understand his position in society, that he continues to desire an official position of importance on the terms of others who have agendas that he does not understand. Specifically, the grandfather at a later moment, right, he will remember him saying, I have been a traitor all my born days, and um, you have to fight the, the real fight, right? And, and the invisible man continues to reflect upon these, these words and to try to make sense with them as far as keep this nigger boy running. What am I supposed to do? What has just happened at the Battle Royale? How am I to understand my position? And what I really think Ellison is trying to get us to see here is that he needs this protagonist to draw upon his own cultural experiences, black history, what blacks have done before him. He needs to define himself not based on what the majority culture says is important, but based on what his family legacy, what blacks have accomplished before him, the things that he can do to take up his rightful position as an African American. Well, why is this important? Because Ellison profoundly believes that African Americans' position in this country, in the United States of America, from the moment we step foot on this soil, has profoundly shaped the nation that is. And that if we somehow abdicate that very special role we have in helping to make this country a better place, then we have abdicated our position, not only as African Americans, but Ellison would say as Americans. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm realizing something as I'm sharing all this. I think Professor Hill is correct. What she just said, I think it's totally accurate. At the same time, uh, Ralph Ellison, victim of racism, I think that would be accurate. I don't think too many people would fuss at me about that. Um, victim of racism, and I think he might have been a little bit confused about race. His book is a lot to a large degree about being a black male and being confused uh, about things that are happening to you. Uh, I think this book might have revealed more truth about white supremacy than even he was aware of. Um, I'll just state that for the record, and then I'll go to a page to read. This is what I mean when I say Ralph Ellison is pretty much saying exactly what I'm saying every page of this book. When I say the problem is white people, I could substitute paragraphs from this book. I'll go to 263. Uh, this is when, uh, whew, man, <laughs> black people are being evicted, uh, thrown out of their home by white people. Uh, you get some other papers, slave papers, uh, some other important papers get thrown out here. At any rate, uh, a white man who is tossing them out, he says, look, lady, uh, more to the rest of us than to her. I don't want to do this. I have to do it. They sent me up here to do it. If it was left to me, you could stay here till hell freezes over. These white folks, this is the one of the black people that's being evicted, black female. These white folks, Lord, these white folks, she moaned. Her eyes turned toward the sky as an old man pushed past me and went to her. Hun, hun, he said, placing his hand on her shoulder. It's the agent, not these gentlemen. He's the one. He says it's the bank, but you know he's the one. We've done business with him for over 20 years. Don't tell me that, she said. It's 
all white folks, not just one, they all against us. Every stinking low down one of them. Now, for a statement like that to come out in a book in night, and it's tons of these sort of statements all over the book. Um, I don't. I mean, I just. I think he's communicating a lot about what it means to be white, what it means to be a white person, um, what it means to be a black person in a system of white supremacy. I think he's revealing a lot, maybe even more than he was aware. Um, what do you think, Professor Hill? Well, I love this episode. I think it's a crucial one in the text. Um, I think you're exactly right that here the, the racial distinction between the evicting agent um, and those that have been sent to this Harlem community. If you remember, this is a moment where the protagonist has exited the hospital. He's come to New York. He's gone through certain experiences, and he has finally landed in the home of Mary Rambo, who really represents an authentic woman who still is very much connected to her black heritage. She says, I'm in New York, but New York ain't in me. And what she means by that is that I have retained a sense of who I am based on a complicated past that I refuse to let go of, that I still continue to see myself and my peers through that lens. And just to give, um, Gus, your listeners a bit of a background uh, that they may not have access to, I've done a lot of work with the manuscripts of Invisible Man. And I just want to sort of broaden this scene by saying that Ellison really wanted to spend more time depicting the life of Harlem. He was very much invested in giving his readers a sense of the vitality of the African-American community in Harlem at this moment. Um, so here when we have, the, because it, and he actually uh, published an, an unpublished section of this text um, in the 60s as a part of a collection called Soon One Morning. Um, so, so Mary Rambo, he imagined her having a larger, a larger role in the text, and he imagined the protagonist spending more time in Harlem to confront moments like this, this eviction, where he comes, he sees this old couple, the provos, being evicted. He sees all of these um, artifacts from their home that they are on display, not because this couple wants them on display. They have literally been evicted. They have been um, thrown out of their home, the, themselves and these articles, for the world to see. So this is a kind of ex moment of exposure, a forced exposure. Um, but one, one thing I would point out, Gus, that I think is really important is that in many moments like this, Allison is more invested in what the protagonist sees and understands and doesn't see and understand. And here, what he is very invested in is that the protagonist heretofore has not been able to come to terms with the complexity of African-American experience in this country. He wants to simplify it, okay? And when he sees this old couple's belongings littered across the snow, he cannot make sense of what seem to be contradictory objects. There are things that suggest that maybe this man was once a minstrel. There are freedom papers. There are images of Marcus Garvey, I think, a Hollywood star, Abraham Lincoln, all of these things together. It's hard to make to synthesize them such that we understand what this old couple really stands for. And what the protagonist decides to do is rather than try to get his arms around the true complexity of African American life, he starts talking. And by starting to talk, he stops thinking. And I want to use this as one more moment to say what Ellison advocates is that African Americans and all people, but specifically African Americans, and here's where I will agree with you, that if you're living in a society where other people have power over you, it is incumbent upon you to understand yourself and your position such that you can act accordingly. And here the protagonist does not. He rejects an opportunity at real introspection in favor of just giving a kind of speech full of pat phrases. And I, 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 I could say more, but I think I'll stop there. Hmm. Uh, you want me to share one more thought? Well, sure. One thing I want to um, point to, and I think that Dr. Kevorkian began with the interview, The Art of Fiction, and I love Ellison's interviews, his essays from Shadow uh, and Act and Going to the Territory, because these are the moments where we get access to his words, to his philosophy, to his world view. Um, and one thing he says is, the hero's invisibility is not a matter of being seen, but a refusal to run the risk of his own humanity 
which involves guilt. And that's what he's experiencing here. Ellison goes on to say, this is not an attack upon white society. It is what the hero refuses to do in each section which leads him to further action. He must assert and achieve his own humanity. And those are Ellison's words from this 1955 interview shortly after um, he published this text to such great acclaim. And so for him, the real failure of this protagonist is his refusal to think in complicated ways about his own history in this country in relation to both African Americans and to white Americans. Because you have to admit, there are some pretty villainous uh, African American characters in this text as well, um, you know, like Dr. Bledsoe, the college president, and a few other operators that, um, that, that, that he has to sort of work through as he comes to a sense of who he is in this text. Uh, again, context of white supremacy, uh, our guest, uh, University of Iowa's Professor Lena Hill. Um, you, I thought, very important. You talked about uh, this character's quest for humanity, freedom. I think those, those two kind of go, uh, they're intertwined, I think, in this book. And uh, the invisible man is searching for, or I think he's accumulating papers, uh, and in his quest for humanity and freedom, uh, I think it frequently ends up being about being with white people, being accepted by white people, and specifically white women. Um, I think, uh, and again, just folks, I think uh, I think to really get the best out of Ellison, in my opinion, I think it's it's best to push really hard to be as explicit and as honest as possible uh, about racism, white supremacy. Uh, and I mean, it's stifling global dominance. Uh, I think that, I mean, for me, that really pushed a lot out of this book for me, just that I had missed before. Uh, and I think white women, you talk about that in your essay, um, black males relationship to white women in this book. Um, I will start uh, page 18, pages 18 and 19, uh, beginning of the book, back to the battle royal, which is uh, central to this book. Um, he has, he, I'll just go right to uh, what Ellison wrote. Uh, he, this is the group of uh, black males, uh, young children who are at the Battle Royal, just for listeners. Uh, they're about to uh, engage in this boxing match, being blindfolded, uh, very beginning of the book. Uh, we were rushed up to the front of the ballroom, where it smelled even more strongly of tobacco and whiskey. Then we were pushed into place. I almost wet my pants. A sea of faces, some hostile, some amused, ringed around us, and in the center, facing us, stood a magnificent blonde, stark, naked. There was dead silence. I felt a blast of cold air chill me. I tried to back away, but they were behind me and around me. Some of the boys stood with lowered heads, trembling. I felt a wave of irrational guilt and fear. My teeth chattered. My skin turned to goose flesh. My knees knocked. Yet I was strongly attracted and looked in spite of myself. Had the price of looking been blindness, I would have looked. Just that sentence stuck out to me way different this time around in a book titled Invisible Man, where the character says, <clears throat> I'll read that one more time, uh, had the price of looking been blindness, I would have looked. The hair was yellow like that of a circus cupid doll. The face heavily powdered and rouged as though to form an abstract mask. The eyes hollow and smeared a cool blue, the color of a baboon's butt. I felt a desire to spit upon her as my eyes brushed slowly over her body. Her breasts were firm and round as the domes of East Indian temples, and I stood so close as to see the fine skin texture and beads of pearly perspiration glistening like dew around the pink and erected buds of her nipples. I wanted at one and the same time to run from the room, 
to sink through the floor or to go to her and cover her from my eyes and the eyes of the others with my body, to feel the soft thighs, to caress her and destroy her, to love her and murder her, to hide her from her, to hide from her, excuse me, and yet to stroke where below the small American flag tattooed upon her belly, her thighs formed a capital V. I had a notion that all that of all in the room, she saw only me with her impersonal eyes. And you just talked about being an American. The American flag first appears in this book, I believe, Mm -hmm. the white woman. Um, What is going on with the relationships between black males and white women in this book? Yeah, that is an excellent question, it's, and I, I, this is a great passage um, to use to try to make sense of what Ellison is doing. One, we want to remember uh, the historical setting. This is the segregated South. This moment could not be more charged. This is what African-American men could be lynched for, even suggesting the desire uh, for a white woman. Um, so we, so, so it's really um, his feelings of almost wanting to wet in his pants. Um, we might laugh, but we understand it when we understand the stakes at this moment in this nation's history of a young black boy being forced in the presence of white men to look upon a naked white woman. Okay, so what do we do with his response? One, we have to note why these white men want these black boys to view her. And that is because they want to project their own sexually licentious desires for a white woman onto the black man. Okay, there's a history in this country of white men saying the reason African-American men cannot be given equal status and African-American people can't be given equal status is because they will, you know, want to marry white women. They'll want to. Right now we live in a moment where interracial marriage is something that we see and accept. But at this moment, that was not the case. So these white men, they don't want to deal with their own desires for white womanhood that are uh, anything but pure. And if you look on the the next page, for those uh, listeners who are looking at the book on the next page, on page 20, one of these white men, these are all power brokers in his community, um, on page 20, he says that he notices a certain merchant who followed her hungrily, his lips loose and drooling. He was a large man who wore diamond studs and a shirt front which swelled with the ample paunch underneath. And each time the blonde swayed her undulating hips, he ran his hand through his thin hair up the bald head. And with his arms upheld, his posture clumsy like that of an intoxicated panda, wound his belly in a slow and obscene grind. This is Ellison having a bit of fun because African-American men were regularly accused of being animal-like, bestial, and their desires for white women. And instead, he flips the script and shows that it's really white men who often have these kinds of desires. However, the true irony that I think you picked up on and focusing on uh, the protagonist saying the price of looking had it been blindness, I would have looked, focusing on the V of her legs, really being sexually attracted to her. The true irony is that invisible man does not get it. He does not get that these white men want to see him desire her, want to see him conflicted. Instead, he gets caught up in the moment. And the larger point that, that I make in my own work is that really the place these young black boys on a very similar plane to this white woman. And what I mean by that is they're there to watch her sexually gratifying dance. So they are ringed around her. You began the passage um, at the place where they're ringed around looking her, looking at her, forming a kind of frame. Well, very soon they're going to be form, forming a ring around these black boys who are half-dressed, They're in boxing trunks. One of the black men, black young boys, has an erection. He's in short shorts. Um, They want to get at these boys. They want to be entertained by watching them in ways that that have sort of sexual undertones. Um, But the entire time, the protagonist is thinking about giving this speech. He mistakenly believes these white men who are really invested in all kinds of other issues of dominance, 
that actually they, they are interested in his speech. And that's the joke here. The joke is that this young African-American protagonist cannot understand all that is in play at this moment in the text. Wow. Um, <laughs> context of white supremacy. Uh, we we focus on this issue. I'll say I I focus on this issue, uh, sexual intercourse between non-white people and white people, a lot on the program. Uh, I'm gonna in the future. I'll say I was influenced by Ellison's work <laughs> when I give explanation <laughs> as to why. Um, but I, I will ask the same question again because I really could have gone to any number uh, of spots in the book if I just wanted to say, you know, what's going on? What is Ellison trying to communicate about sexual relationships between black males and white women? Because it pops up so many times. Uh, the vet, who is my favorite character in the book, uh, who has, you know, incredible lines, the vet equates the white woman with freedom uh, symbolically uh, when he meets. Uh, our the main character uh, on the bus on the way to uh, exiting the college the main character is on his way to New York uh, and that's not the only time in this book where white women and being with white women gets equated with freedom uh, when he is with uh, Sybil uh, he tells her that he feels so free when he's with her uh, and I'll, I'll go to the passage because you talk in some detail in your report uh, when he's with the first white woman, uh, where he has sexual intercourse with her, uh, she has she has said that he's primitive and that his voice sounds so. I mean, this is the white person he has sex with, someone who's just said, "Oh, you sound so primitive," uh, and and he's supposed to take this as a compliment. Again, him not really. Well, I guess at this point he is beginning to have some understanding, but in my opinion, not enough quite yet. Um, so I guess 407 uh, before they you know do the act. Um, he writes, uh, let's see. Oh, I turned the page. I turned the page. Whoops, turning back. Sorry about that. Okay, 409. Sorry, I go on the wrong page. 409. Uh, so he writes, uh, and my mind whirled and forgotten stories of male servants summoned to wash the mistress's back, chauffeurs sharing the master's wives. Pullman porters invited into the drawing room of rich wives headed for Reno, thinking. But this is the movement, the brotherhood. And now I saw her smile, saying, yes, Gwen, dear, yes, as one free hand went up as though to smooth her hair. And in one swift motion, the red robe swept aside like a veil. <laughs> That didn't even catch that before a veil. So now he can see clearly <laughs> this white woman getting naked. Incredible. Uh, and I went breathless at the petite and generously curved, nude, framed, delicate, and firm. In the, uh, in the And generously curved, nude, framed, delicate, and firm in the glass. It was like a dream interval. And an, in an instant, it swung back, and I saw only her mysteriously smiling eyes above the rich red robe. I was heading for the door, torn between anger and a fierce excitement. Hearing the phone click down as I started past and feeling her swirl against me, and I was lost for the conflict between the ideological and the biological. Duty and desire had become too subtly confused and i'll i'll stop there but man that just those last few sentences i think white people love that and i think they have a clear understanding this is what happens when non-white people engage in sexual intercourse with white people and i think ellison he brings this up over and over and over in the book uh what do you think professor hill well, I think you're exactly right. Um, I want to go back to your sort of introduction and in, in, in noting the vet. Um, and you're right to do that because the vet really is a symbol of knowledge, someone who understands um, social interaction in this country much more uh, than the protagonist does. So when he says symbolic freedom, right, you won't have enough time to experience real freedom, so you'll try to have an intimate experience with a white woman in order to feel free. Well, this, of course, is one more shibboleth. And I, I just want to 
one, one moment I love in the prologue, and I think this will help us understand. When the protagonist is trying to figure out what he's going to do, there is a black woman, an old singer of spirituals, and she says, um, I've been trying to figure out freedom. And he says, well, what is this freedom? And she says, freedom is knowing how to say what you got up in your head, okay? And really what the protagonist is doing throughout this text, he is writing his experiences in such a way that he frees himself from misconceptions he's been held to throughout the narrative. And these moments with white women are some of the most dazzling examples of his misunderstanding of freedom. So whether it's with the nude at the beginning or this moment, I like to refer to this woman as the mystery woman uh, because he goes home with this woman after his first speech for the brotherhood on the woman question, which again, he actually imagines that being asked to speak about white woman and two white women is, is, this, is, is really some kind of accomplishment, right? He thinks that, wow, this organization really believes in me because it's allowing me, a black man, to talk to white women. So when he goes home with this woman, um, he's already, you're right, excited because in, in some way this solidifies his moving up in the world, if, if so to say. Um, but one thing he does not understand, and the same, I want to connect this to my previous suggestion with the woman at the Battle Royale. He doesn't understand that the white men in charge, that the white men behind the scenes, continue to place him in a similar position as these white women. And what I mean by that is you quoted a moment where he says, these mirrors, right, reflect their images and um, remind us of the long history of white women, whether it be uh, the white slave mistress forcing black male slaves to do their sexual bidding, or whether it be other women who, during segregated times, claim to have been raped by a black man, even though really they were just having some sort of sexual relationship, but the result being a black man's life, um, that he does not understand that though white women manipulate black men, they do so trying to gain a certain power in this society. That white woman, this white woman in this apartment, what is she but an object that her husband has bought? In the same way that he's bought all these paintings and different things for this apartment, he's purchased her. What is she trying to do? She's trying to turn around and purchase Invisible Man, purchase him for sexual favors, purchase him so that she can live some sort of imagined sexual dream, fulfillment, freedom in her own terms. And I love that you end it with um, – these feelings, again, of contradictory emotions, right, that he's confused, that he can't figure out whether he should be angry or excited, um, that he was lost. Um, these are the same kinds of contradictory emotions that he shares as he watches this new dancer in the opening pages of the Battle Royale. And what I think Allison is getting at with both of these, as well as the Sybil moment that you pointed to, is that as long as African-American men continue to associate sexual intercourse with white women as freedom, as having reached some larger plane of accomplishment, then they are missing the boat. They are missing the boat not only in terms of their individual lives, but in what they really need to do to change the structures in this country for the better by refusing to actually accept positions of authority that will allow this country to evolve in ways that Ellison suggests it has to, to realize um, what, what, and I'm really using Ellison's words, um, it's, it's greatness. These are some of the things he says in the, in the epilogue. Context of white supremacy. Um, wow. I, I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. Um, I did want to, uh, before I leave, because this, this topic comes up frequently on the program, uh, I think a lot of non-white people get confused about that soothing lotion uh, and, you know, being able to uh, get into bed with a white woman and thinking that, you know, we don't have racism anymore uh, because we can have sex with white people. And I definitely think that is very confused thinking. Um, I noticed a trend in this book uh, frequently when sexual intercourse with white women is presented, it accompanies boxing. Uh, happens quite a bit, and I I just wanted to see uh, you know what you what you think about this association because when 
uh, he and Sybil. Uh, Sybil is another white woman later in the book um, where, you know, same thing. They're supposed to engage in sexual intercourse. And she, I mean, really interesting passage. I read some of that last time, so I don't want to repeat myself, but uh, wow. Um, at any rate, uh, Sybil, she is talking about uh, Joe Lewis. And Joe Lewis and Paul Robeson, they are mentioned uh, more than once uh, in this book. They get referenced. And I, it's interesting for a lot of reasons. I think it's uh, any time boxing comes up in this book, I assume he's, you know, purposely drawing attention back to the Battle Royal. Um, I think that's I, I suspect that's got to be one. Uh, then with Paul Robeson, uh, it got really interesting because when I when I heard Paul Robeson's name, uh, I thought, OK, this is someone who, you know, fought against racism, white supremacy uh, explicitly was, you know, recognized around the world for working against racism. Uh, and then the next thing I thought was, oh, Paul Robeson uh, also did uh, Othello. Um, and then the next thing I thought was, oh, wow, Paul Robeson also played Jack Johnson. And I had to dig a little bit, but he was in the play Black Boy, 1926. Uh, and the play, he played uh, Brutus Jones. And this character is loosely based on Jack Johnson. So uh, that was another cowbell. And and we're back to the boxing ring. Um and I just thought, wow, this pattern to come up so frequently, um, even later in the book, uh, Joe Lewis is mentioned. And it says Joe Lewis, uh, when Joe Lewis beat Jim Jeffries, Joe Lewis never fought Jim Jeffries. It was Jack Johnson that fought Jim, uh, Jim Jeffries and beat him. Uh, and I mean, that's, that's a whole other program to get on Jack Johnson. But I was just curious as to why this continued association. And I mean, Jack Johnson, boxing, white women, <laughs> why this continued association uh, in the book? Why do you think that is? Well, I think it's a it's a metaphor for the fight that Ellison um, sees African American men particularly involved in. Um, so, in in many cases, uh, before he gives his first speech for the Brotherhood, he sees a photograph of a boxer that has been beaten blind in the ring. So, oftentimes, it's not just that they that that he associates um, women or the protagonist with boxing, but more so the damage that results from a failure to understand the true consequences of each experience the protagonist finds himself involved in. So he is metaphorically beat up, right, by his failure to discern the truth of these matters. Um, and I feel, to, to, to be honest and to maybe sort of um, maybe rustle things up here, when you look at the, the drafts, the manuscript drafts, this novel was originally intended to be over 800 pages. If any of you ever want to go to the Library of Congress, you can actually see the typewritten pages, Ellison scribbling out notes. Um, you, you have access to this. I mean, you have to register, but you can see these, these pages. One scene that is taken out um, that is not in the published text, but I think might shine a light on the relationships between black men and white women in this text, uh, Ellison initially imagined Todd Clifton, who was another black man, um, who was a member of the Brotherhood, uh, and is a, eventually leaves the organization. But he, he, he originally imagined that he would be married to a white woman, that this was a major, this was a part of the text, that this character, Todd Clifton, was married to a white woman. And he explains to Invisible Man that the reason he leaves the organization is because he felt the organization was using his marriage as a symbol, and he didn't want it to be a symbol. He wanted them to just be married like two ordinary people, um, but that this political organization wouldn't allow them to just be a married couple. And I think it's a, it's a difficult thing to deal with, um, as well as certain parts of Ellison's personal life. You know, he was someone who had interactions um, with white women, many of his friends, Richard Wright, married to a white woman. So I just want to make sure that we're understanding the larger context for how Ellison um, thinks about African-American men related to white women, because I'm not sure if he has a, a problem with it at its very heart. He himself, um, you know, had a, a, an affair uh, with a white woman. He's documented in um, Arnold Rumpersad's biography. Um, that came out in 2007 on Ralph Ellison. Um, but what he does have a problem with, and I think this is what you were getting at, Gus, earlier, is that when black men try to have sexual relationships 
with white women for purely symbolic reasons. They think they're accomplishing something that they're not. But I don't know if we could go so far as to say that Ellison saw all relationships, all interracial uh, relationships as problematic based on his own personal biography um, and on excise materials from this, from this novel. Um, it's been something difficult uh, for me to get my, my arms around and learning more about um, Ellison, but I think it's difficult to sort of um, get around. Wow. Uh, again, I would uh, repeat what I said earlier. I think Ralph Ellison, definitely a victim of racism, uh, and I think he might have been confused about some aspects of white supremacy. If he had sex with a white woman, I would definitely say he had some confusion uh, about racism and white supremacy. Um, I will be very clear. I am totally opposed to sexual intercourse between white people and non-white people. As long as the system of racism exists, it is totally incorrect and should not happen. Uh, Ellison might not be, you know, advocating that with the work, but I definitely think it supports what I'm saying to a T. <laughs> it is a problem for non-white people. You end up lost and confused, conflicted <laughs> about how am I supposed to feel about this white person that I'm in bed with? What am I supposed to be doing against racism, white supremacy? And is this working against racism? You just end up being lost and confused. Um, and I mean, I believe he and Richard Wright knew one another. I think uh, Richard Wright, uh, you said he married a white woman and native son. I mean, <laughs> Just every every example that I have, Scottsboro Boys got brought up here. Frederick Douglass is mentioned a lot in this book. He also married a white woman. I just don't have an example of a black person, a non-white person, being in a sexual relationship with a white person and that being an improvement. Um, I just don't know of that. If you do, I would love to hear it, but uh, I'm not aware of that. Do you mean in the text? Uh, in real life or the text. Uh, certainly the example. <laughs> So I'm very serious. I'm very serious in real life uh, and, and or the text. Uh, I'm not aware of any examples of that being an improvement in the text. It's a slam dunk. I mean, every time I see it pop up in fiction, it's terrible. Uh, it's it's native son. It is the destruction of a black person. They end up lost and confused. I mean, it's over Othello, native son, <laughs> invisible man. I mean, it's terrible. She uh Shall I just read the civil chapter? How about that? I'll uh, I'll skip to uh, 508 uh, just to to kind of cap this this portion to make sure we cover as much material as possible. But uh, this is Sybil's uh, request of the Invisible Man. This is uh, 510, uh, where she says uh, she this is her request for him. You can do it. It'll be easy for you, beautiful. Threaten to kill me if I don't give in. You know, talk rough to me, beautiful. A friend of mine said the fellow said, drop your drawers. He said, what? I said, he really did, she said. I looked at her. She was blushing. Her cheeks, even her freckled bosom, were bright red. Go on, I said, as she lay back again. Then what happened? Well, he called her a filthy name, she said, hesitating coyly. She was a leathery old girl with chestnut hair and a fine natural wave, which was now fanned out over the pillow. She was blushing quite deeply. Was this meant to excite me or was it an unconscious expression of revulsion? I mean, talk about confusion. You don't know whether I should be upset. Should I be excited? Anyway, a really filthy name, she said. Oh, he was a brute, huge with white teeth, white teeth, what they call a buck. And he said, bitch, drop your drawers. And then he did it. She's such a lovely girl, too, really delicate with a complexion like strawberries and cream. Now, I mean, even that stood out to me a lot more. We have to stop and give an explanation of this white woman's creamy strawberry complexion after we've just described this black person as a brute buck. At any rate, uh, you can't imagine anyone calling her a name like that. She sat up now, her elbows denting the pillows as she looked into my face. 
Uh, I'm just going to, I don't want to read a whole lot of this, but she goes on the next page to explain that this has been a fantasy she's had for a long time. Uh, the white woman, Sybil, she says, ever since I first heard about it, even when I was a very little girl, I've wanted it to happen to me. 511. Uh, again, I'm, the text, when we're talking fiction, every time I see it, it supports what I'm saying, that this is the worst. This is racism, white supremacy at its, at its worst. Uh, even when I read your work, and you uh, get to read some of your work as well, uh, where you said uh, on page 52, moreover, uh, his framed miniature recalls the framing at the Battle Royal a point Ellison makes in his notes as he contemplates using the same symbolism as Battle Royal to show that incest is the ultimate expression of monopoly. I believe that's your work, and I think every time I see it, especially when we're talking fiction, when white people have sex with non-white people, it is the ultimate expression of monopoly and domination. And I think this text for sure supports what I'm saying. At least at least am I correct on this text uh, supporting what I'm saying in that regard? I, I think so. I think you're exactly right that each time a white woman tries to have intimate sexual relations with an invisible man, she is attempting to assert her authority over him. However, and you knew there was a however coming, Again, I think Ellison is most invested in the protagonist coming to terms, understanding this. What does he say after? And by the way, Sybil wants him to rape her, and it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because he's drank too much, and he says she's hired a boy for a man's job. Basically, he's physically incapable of carrying out this fantasy. And the reason he writes on her stomach, Sybil, you were raped by Santa Claus, surprise, which a lot of readers have a kind of question mark. Why does he write that on her stomach? Well, because Santa Claus is a myth. And I hope I'm not upsetting anyone out there who may still believe in Santa Claus, but Santa Claus is a myth, just like the myth that all African American men are these sexually potent individuals just ready to perform at a moment's notice. Um, and so again and again and again, Ellison is showing the protagonist the need to extricate himself from such myths, from such fantasies. At a certain point, the protagonist says in this episode, um, what is this, another birth of a nation? Right? And he's referencing this you know, horribly uh, racist movie um, from the early 20th century by Griffith that really portrays all black men as rapists. Um, and Ellison's point is, if African-American men can't accurately assess the way they're viewed in this country, what are they going to do? But I think another point he makes is what about other people who give in to these myths, to these ideas that have no moment or idea of reality attached to them? And I just want to add, um, because it's always in my mind that I think in my essay I mention, uh, possibly in a footnote, um, some other extricated moments that deal with the protagonist's interactions with white women and surprisingly enough, black women. One major um, issue is originally Ellison had him desiring to join the brotherhood because he was interested in a white woman. And interestingly enough, this relationship was actually positive. It, would, it, was, it was really why he wanted to be a part of this organization. Now, he also had a sexual relationship with a black woman. Um, and this relationship with the black woman, she is a virgin, and he wants to take, she wants him to take her virginity. Um, and it's a very explicit uh, scene, and we can imagine why it didn't get published in 1952. Um, but I think the point that Ellison is making as he uh, creates all of these different um, uh, episodes between the protagonist and these women is that the protagonist doesn't understand himself and continually allows himself to be defined by others, whether they be white women, white men, black women, black men. His problem is that he allows others, whether it be with sheets of paper. Remember, some of those sheets of paper um, that he collects, that's a white man naming him. And if you remember, since we're talking about white women, it is the white woman, Emma, who takes that slip of paper out of her chest, right? She has money, and she gives it to Brother Jack. So he allows white women and white men to name him, to define him, and to determine how he will act. 
And this is what Ralph Ellison wholeheartedly rejects and insists that invisible man has to grow beyond. Well said. Uh, our guest, uh, Professor Lena Hill, uh, University of Iowa, uh, I believe uh, my co-host, uh, Justice, is also with us. Um, if you have some questions you would like to ask uh, Professor Hill, uh, your line is open. Please uh, feel free. Greetings. Um, um, greetings, uh, Professor Hill. Um, how are you doing today? Good. Thank you. What is constructive about being a professor? What is constructive? Yeah, about being a professor. That's a wonderful question. Um, I have to admit that I love my job. Um, I have really enjoyed being at the University of Iowa. Um, I did my undergraduate work at Howard University and my graduate work at Yale. Um, and one thing I love about the classroom, about being a professor in the college classroom, um, is the dynamism. And what I mean by that is, earlier in the program, Gus asked me how many times had I read Invisible Man. Well, I'm not sure, but one thing I can say is that every time I read it with a different group of students, I get something different, I have a different experience, and I gain more from it. Um, so no two days are ever the same. And uh, it's really gratifying to, throughout the course of one semester, see students' ability to understand literature, to understand um, other topics that I might be teaching, uh, to see them grow and become much more sophisticated. Uh, in some of my African American Studies classes, teaching them specifically at the University of Iowa with a student body who may not have had much interaction with people of different races from different backgrounds. Um, again, it is, it is, it's a wonderful experience to see students faced with a body of knowledge um, that they heretofore had not had access to, um, and to begin to see the world from a different point of view, a more critical, analytical point of view. Um, those are the things I think I, I really enjoy the most about being a professor, is, is seeing student growth um, through our conversations and through their writing uh, and their um, articulations of what they are reading within the classroom setting. What does the title of, of the book, the, the Invisible Man, mean to you? That The Invisible Man, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of what you said. What does the title of the book, The Invisible Man, mean to you? Oh, the title of the text. Um, that's a good question. That's something that in my own work I, I, I really suggest that many of us critics, many of us literary critics haven't thought enough about. Um, because it is so heavily inflected with sight and vision. Um, so in the opening pages of the text, you have the protagonist contemplating what it means to be invisible. And that's something that we can take from different points of view. But it seems like what Ellison is invested in suggesting through that title, Invisible Man, um, is that this protagonist has to come to understand how he sees himself in American society. Um, and in the beginning, what he wants most is to be seen. He gives speeches. He even goes through that fight at the Battle Royale in order for others to see him. Um, he goes through his membership in the Brotherhood, hoping to gain a larger audience who will see him. But in the end, he has to understand that as long as he allows them to define him in terms that make sense to them, not terms that he embraces and projects, but terms that others project upon him, he will always be invisible. In the end, his embrace of this idea of invisibility is actually self-affirming because what he's really saying is, I'm invisible rather than a black man who's going to be defined by other people. And those other people include people like uh, President Bledsoe, the president of a black college, um, Norton, who's this white Bostonian, and we can go on and on and on. But he rejects their attempts to picture him, to make him visible in their terms, and claims that he's invisible, which really is a claim. It's an assertion of his own humanity 
that is built upon his own understanding of African American experience um, as a black man. So that's that's for me. For me, the title is a play on what, on the one hand, might be as a as a position of weakness that is turned into a position of authority and self-assertion. Since you have read the book, The Invisible Man, what constructive information did you get from it that you can use today? Well, actually, I think it's it's really a useful text um, at this moment in history because what Allison, I think, gets that a lot of forget, even as we um, have more opportunities, we have opportunities to go to different schools, to have certain jobs. I mean, we really are living in a moment where I think um, African Americans and and people really of all ethnic groups um, are seeing themselves enjoy uh, certain privileges, access to different opportunities that heretofore we have not had. But I think Ellison would advocate, and this is one thing I think about every time I read this text, is that you never let your guard down. And what I mean by that is you always remain a critical reader of situations you find yourself in. You never accept things at face value. And Gus was saying he loved the character of the vet. And I I think Ellison loves that character too because what that character advocates, he tells Invisible Man, look beneath the surface. And what that means to me is Every time you find yourself in a classroom, every time you find yourself in a different job, every time you find yourself in a social setting, never take for granted that what seems to be going on, you know, there's nothing beyond that. Because the moment you do that, you fail to understand the truth of a situation. And I think we could even go on to say you might fail to either enjoy it as much as you could or to extricate yourself from it, if it's a a poisonous situation, but that what we can advocate is that this protagonist goes through life accepting what other people think about him far too long. And when I teach this um, text to my undergraduates, one thing that we always um, get out of it is the need that uh, for people at this, because really it, it follows the protagonist from his graduation from high school through you know a few years after that. So he really is a, a sort of peer of the college student. Um, but this is a moment where you definitely need to be invested in defining yourself and defining what you want to be in this life um, and really coming to understand your own individuality and your own agency. Um, and, and that's what I kind of get even as um, – you know, a professor who's taught the the book again and again is is Ellison really saying, you know, continue to be critical, continue um, to use all your powers of analysis whenever you get the opportunity. What information does a man can non white people use today to replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible? Well, I think, um, and this is something I've been sort of working through as I continue to deal with this text and to understand it uh, with regard to the writing that Ellison uh, continued to work on throughout his life, um, is that he would say, look, some of us may focus too much on accumulating material wealth instead of intellectual wealth. And if you're going to fight power structures, and power structures change, But they always, in Ellison's mind, I think, are based upon a group of people who know more either about a certain system, um, a certain body of knowledge. They have greater access to it because they know more. Ellison would say we have to not allow that situation to continue. So what I would say we need to do today is to continue, whether it be through improving um, secondary education. I mean, I personally am a huge advocate for addressing the needs of uh, secondary education in areas, um, underprivileged areas, areas where students from the beginning um, are not being placed on on a level playing ground because they are in schools that are not giving them what they need um, to succeed uh, in this society. Uh, that we cannot accept the status quo. We have to, and this is something I I, I truly get from this text and I get from Ellison, we have to really be warriors. We have to be out there fighting 
um, to make sure that all people truly have access to education and uh, educational systems that will prepare them um, to take full advantage of, of any possibilities that they may find in, the, in, in their future lives. So that, that's one thing that I feel is um, very pertinent um, today to, to, to helping us address uh, systems of inequality. If you have offspring, how do you help your offspring learn and understand racism, white supremacy? <laughs> That's wonderful. I, I have two children. I have a, a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. Um, and it's so funny that you, you asked that question. My daughter um, very much enjoys American Girl dolls, and I don't know if, how familiar the audience is with American Girl dolls, but the American Girl doll that represents a moment in this country, the, the African-American American Girl doll, her name is Addie. Um, and Addie is an, a slave who escapes uh, slavery. And the conversations that my daughter and I have had as she has read this set of books, there are, I think, six books, and they really trace um, Addie's life from the moment that she escapes with her mother after her father and brother have been sold away. Um, and they have to leave her baby sister behind because in escaping slavery, the baby's cries might attract those uh, who are hunting them. Um, and then when Addie does reach freedom and her family is able to reunite, um, she still faces, of course, all kinds of trials and challenges. Um, and those conversations that my daughter and I have had as a result of this fictional character um, have allowed us to think about um, interactions between races, um, certain challenges uh, that African Americans face, continue to face, even though slavery, of course, is over, but continue um, to deal with, um, have been really fruitful. And, and for me, especially since we've moved to Iowa City, uh, I grew up in the South. Um, you know, I went to a historically black college university as an undergrad. Um, so this, in many ways, um, is a different situation. Uh, and for my daughter, who often finds herself in, in positions where she is the only African American, um, I try to emphasize the importance of her believing always that she is just as good as everyone else. Um, we make sure that she thrives in school. Um, I have to say that the uh, public school system here is, is wonderful, um, and they've, they've, they've I, I mean, I can't say enough as far as how I, I feel we're very fortunate and blessed to have uh, the public schools we have. But to emphasize to her that as a black uh, young girl, um, she does have to always remember um, the special history uh, of this country and what it means um, as she strives to reach her own goals. But I think um, as a mother, it's most important for me to infuse within her a real sense of confidence, a sense of self-power and self-understanding. Um, and I'm really happy that she's able to ask certain questions about, you know, what it means to be black. I mean, from the time that she was in preschool, uh, she said, you know, well, why am I the only brown person? Um, and, you know, I just feel it's important to be frank um, and honest uh, as she makes her way. Uh, through this world. Um, uh, oh, uh, I don't have any more questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, context of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade. We, uh, we had a uh, Birth of a Nation mentioned today, Gus T. Renegade. Um, I will give out the uh, give out the numbers, folks. If you want to call in to get a question, uh, if you uh, would like to dial in uh, on the free HD line uh, with your Skype, you can Skype to free conference call HD dot com seven six seven six, and then the code is five six four nine four three. Give that one more time. Uh, if you want to use your Skype, uh, the free conference call line is free conference call HD dot com seven six seven six and the code is five six four nine four three. Uh, if you want to dial in, 
uh, with your phone, uh, the number 760-569-7676. I'll give it one more time. Uh, 760-569-7676. And the code again is 564 Nine four three. Um, <clears throat> you, uh, Professor Hill, in uh, your report on uh, Invisible Man, uh, you talk about the importance of understanding, and you just Justice uh, in answering her question talked about the importance of being alert and having an understanding of what's happening around you. Um, I contend we're in a system of white supremacy, uh, and I also contend that white people are a lot more informed about what that system is and how it works. Um, but you write, the first three sections of my essay examine the inability of the protagonist, referred to only as invisible man, to read visually constructed meaning. And I think, uh, at least when I read the book, and I, I want to see you know, what you think, uh, when I read the book this time around, um, that it may it just it reminded me of Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Um, he's authored several books. He'll be on the program tomorrow. His phrase that he uh, begins his both of his books: uh, "If you do not understand racism, white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you understand will only confuse you." and that's really what the symbolism uh, in Invisible Man, uh, all of the uh, the symbolisms to being blind, and I mean it's it happens so often in the book, uh, the battle royal where he's blinded, uh, we're blindfolded, excuse me, uh, the first time that he makes his speech with the Brotherhood, um, being blinded be uh, because of the light. Um, the reference I made earlier, I would have, uh, if the price had been blindness, I would have looked at this white woman. Uh, it just pops up over and over again. Uh, Barbie giving his speech at the college, he's blind. Uh, Brother Jack, does not, I mean, it's it's repeated uh, so many times. And I think, at least my understanding, particularly for black people, um, it's, it's Mr. Fuller's quote. If you don't understand racism, everything else is just, you're going to be totally confused. And uh, in fact, with that understanding, so many more things about this book made sense to me when I read it this time around. Uh, the scene that you mentioned uh, where the couple is being evicted and all of these objects, you know, uh, slave papers uh, of freedom, uh, Marcus Garvey, there's a pamphlet uh, with Mr. Garvey's work, uh, all of these items. And really, to me, it just it represented, it represented the, the pitiful state uh, the pitiful and confused state of black people under white supremacy, um, the, the Marcus Garvey papers thrown out in the trash uh, with all these other, uh, I mean, it's junk, basically. This junky, I think that's part of the shame that he appear, uh, that the main character experiences when this eviction takes place. It's, it's seeing how weak black people are. Like uh, when the crowd, I thought it was, it stood out to me seeing the crowd scene. It's such a visual uh, part of the book. I mean, you feel like you've watched it. Um, but when the crowd uh, is chanting, they're so proud to see black males standing up and defending uh, the black. Fe In fact, when the black female gets struck by the white enforcement officer, I thought of Seattle uh, when the black female was hit by the enforcement officer and everyone just stood around. No one did anything. It, it was a flashback to that scene. And in this, the black males, they stand up, you know, they, they beat the white guy up, and they're so proud. They're taking the stuff back in, and it, it seems like that was really important. I think you talked about it, it was important to Ellison to uh, display Harlem and the pride that he had, I think, for black people. And it really comes through in that scene. But I think more than anything, it comes through repeatedly in, in so many – if I had to pick one character so I can hush, it would be Lucius Brockway. Lucius Brock, if you do not understand racism, white supremacy, everything else you understand will be confused, and invariably you will be helping white people maintain their system. And Lucius Brockway, black male, integral part of the uh, Liberty Paints. They make white paint. They are no <laughs> in a book titled Invisible Man. They are known for making optic white. Uh, and this black male, he brags. He is proud about his role in producing whiteness, the best 
whiteness. And he's paid like a janitor. <laughs> this character, Lucius Brock, he's paid like a janitor. And white people will come out and beg him to work in the dungeons of their factory to make their white paint. And he brags about this setup. Uh, and will fight to keep his job, <laughs> fight anyone, black person, white person, to come and take his job. And I'll just I'll give the logo that he boasts about this logo that he made for Liberty Paints, where he's paid like a janitor. Uh, the logo that he makes, uh, it's the right white if it's optic white. Or I think I reversed it. If it's optic white, it's the right white. And I just, <laughs> that is all you need to know. If you're confused about racism, most likely you're going to be Lucius Brockway. Um, what do you think, Professor Hill? Well, I think you're, you're right. Lucius Brockway is, is, is the best example, the most telling example um, of a black man who has profoundly misunderstood his position both within that company and that company being a larger metaphor for the country. He's profoundly uh, misunderstood exactly the nature of his contribution to the country. And I think what Ellison's point is, his misunderstanding is based on his failure to conceive of his own importance. And what I mean by that is Lucius Brockway is down in the basement, really responsible for making this material item uh, that this company sells and makes lots of money off of. He's White, responsible whiteness, for that's, that's important. That's what I mean. See, we got to be explicit. See, that's, that's like not talking about white, uh, white people. What Liberty Paints is known for making is whiteness. Am I telling the truth, Professor Hill? It's whiteness and but yes, no, they are specifically in whiteness that accomplishes what? Whiteness that covers up everything else. What does Lucius Brockway say? He says this paint is so white that if you paint a piece of coal, you wouldn't know. Okay? And when the protagonist looks at this paint, you know what he wonders? He wonders if the buildings on his historically black college are painted with this white paint. And I think what Ellison is getting at here is just how interrelated um, these systems of power that the protagonist doesn't understand are. Okay, he doesn't. The protagonist doesn't understand that he's a lot like Lucius Brockway at this moment. He desires to be affirmed within a world that he doesn't even understand. Um, and I think you could go on to name other characters like Brother Restrum in the Brotherhood organization. Um, another black male who doesn't understand his true um, role within that organization. Um, but what's confusing, I think, for a lot of readers uh, are the characters like True Blood, um, a black man who Allison seems to really like. Okay, He gives this man a lot of space in this text. And my students always are confused um, because this, this black man, True Blood, who's a sharecropper, um, commits incest with his daughter. He impregnates both his daughter and his wife. Um, and he tells this elaborate dream, gives us the details of this elaborate dream uh, that supposedly explain how this happened. And my students always say, well, what is, what is admirable in a character like True Blood? We obviously are not supposed to admire a character like Lucius Brockway, who, as you say, profoundly misinterprets his position within this company and within the country. Well, what do we make of True Blood, who seems to maintain a position of authority, notwithstanding the heinous nature of this act? And what I always tell students is, look, what True Blood discovers that the protagonist fails to see, and you're exactly right as far as the construct of understanding what you see and how you are seen in this text. True Blood understands that people, white men in positions of authority, have already determined who he is. The stereotype of the black man who acts in certain ways based on his sexuality, based on his lack of education, based on his primitive nature, and this is how True Blood is described, they have already determined what kind of man he is. After True Blood commits the sin of incest, he leaves his, his little shack. His wife tells him to get out. The school officials want him gone because he now has become a symbol of all the negative stereotypes that they want to brush under the rug. True Blood goes out, and as he's trying to figure out what to do with his life, he begins to sing the blues. And this is very important. Ellison was very invested in the blues as an art form, 
very invested in jazz as an art form. And what he is suggesting is that at the end of this blues, True Blood says he discovers he's, he, I ain't nobody but myself. And this is a moment of self-affirmation and rejection of the stereotype that others would affix to him, not just the white men in power who have greedily listened to this story, but black men at the university who want to, you know, push it under the rug. True Blood rejects both of those and says, look, nobody is going to tell me what kind of man I am. I'm going to tell myself and I'm going to announce to the rest of you who I am and what belief system I stand upon. And Ellison has him turn to the blues as one more reminder that African Americans have contributed wonderful artistic creations to this country. And this is one thing that Ellison says in many of his interviews and throughout this text when we see characters like Mary Rambo or uh, Peter Wheatstraw, any of you remember the, the blues man and, and pushing the cart when he first arrived in Harlem, um, who, who engages him in a sort of plane of the dozens. Uh, Ellison was a real believer in African American folk culture. He believed that even when we were enslaved, we were contributing magnificent examples of art to this country, and that that is a legacy that we have to be proud of. And again and again and again, the protagonist doesn't want to acknowledge this kind of artistry that African Americans have contributed. He doesn't see it. He doesn't see it as valuable. He doesn't see it as significant. He doesn't see it as a part of what makes the country what it is. And in failing to see that, he doesn't see his own potential greatness. And that's something Ellison wants to get through that Lucius Brockway is blinded to, but by the end of the text, the protagonist has discovered. Hmm. Um, I'll tell you, when I, when I read this book, uh, preparing for this particular program, uh, the episode with True Blood, it had a whole different meaning for me. Um, Tyler Perry, I'll just throw that out there for folks. <laughs> Tyler Perry. So you have a black male uh, who has sexual intercourse with his daughter. Mm -hmm. And the black people at the college want to get rid of this. They want him to leave. White people intervene on his behalf to keep him there. And he says, this is a part of that elaborate text. I mean, this is a lengthy section of the book. Mm -hmm. um, hey, white people stepped up for me. They never have been more helpful. Uh, in fact, before I had sex with my daughter, I couldn't get any help. Had sex with my daughter. Now white people are bending over backwards to help me. Isn't that so, Professor Hill? Yes, that's exactly what he says. But what is the protagonist jealous about? At the end, Norton, the white Bostonian, who the protagonist has been driving around, and from the moment he enters into this scene, the moment we meet the protagonist driving this white patron of the school. He is suppressing who he is. And it's kind of funny. There's an incident um, where he tries to suppress a belch and the horn goes off in the car. And that is like a screaming symbol of what happens when you try to suppress who you are. Norton has his own desires to have had sex with his daughter. He wanted to commit incest, but he has not because of who he thinks he is. When he hears that True Blood has committed incest, he fervently wants to hear this story because he says, and he's an Emersonian character, uh, Ellison was enamored with Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's named after him. Ellison's name is Ralph Waldo Ellison. So we have all of these Emersonian characters throughout the text. So Norton is a kind of Emersonian character. And what he says to True Blood is, you've looked into chaos and you're not destroyed. In many ways, you're the all-seeing eyeball uh, that, that Emerson imagined. Um, and you're right. The white men in power have totally exploited True Blood, okay? But the difference is, while they also have exploited the protagonist, he has not understood his exploitation. And quite frankly, he hasn't gotten much out of it for himself. True, he gets a scholarship to the school, but he doesn't get what the school is teaching him. True Blood understands that while they're using him, he remains in control. Why does he tell this elaborate story to Norton? Because he wants to get paid. What is the protagonist's response when Norton gives True Blood a $100 bill? He's jealous. He actually wants to enact a form of minstrelsy himself 
And he is, he is enacting it. Throughout the drive, he's pretending to be stupid. He's pretending to be all that this man wants him to be, all in hopes that this white man will show favor on him. But when he sees true blood doing something very similar but in different, a different way, he looks down condescendingly. And I think what Ellison wants us to see is, you know what? You can behave in a minstrel-like way in a lot of, through a lot of different fashions. It's not just by sexual deviation. You can do it by not being yourself, by pretending to be stupid, by asking a white man, can you tell me, I'll tell you later what your fate is. I mean, there are all these ways that we see the protagonist in acting a role. And Ellison wants to tell us none of this is acceptable. You have to, and I think the only thing that is saving, that the saving grace of true blood and how we understand his name, true blood, true to himself, is that in the end, he rejects, he resoundly refuses to allow anyone to interpret his life and draw a conclusion other than himself. He's going to remain in charge of interpreting who he is. context of white supremacy. Uh, again, uh, our guest, uh, Professor Lena Hill, uh, University of Iowa. Um, before uh, I go to the phone lines, um, the bank uh, in this book, um, yeah. it uh, has a lot of symbolism. Uh, in fact, this is not my question. I'm just throwing this out for people to kind of ponder on. Um, in fact, uh, from this point forward, whenever I hear a non-white person saying that it's class, it's, it's money, it's not about race, I unfortunately am going to have the image of this bank uh, because Ellison is, I mean, such a genius. Uh, he gives you such a wonderful illustration of this minstrel black bank uh, stuffing coins in its mouth. Uh, and that is going to be the unfortunate image that I have from this point forward when I hear non-white people saying it's class. It's about money. It's not about racism. Uh, that's just to ponder on. Uh, my question with the bank, um, I think so. it comes up so many times about identity. And you just said defining, uh, making your own terms, defining things for yourself, um, you deciding who you are, not letting other people give you a name or a title or uh, ways that you should behave or think. Um, and I think, uh, at least on this broadcast, one of one of our core <laughs> principles uh, is that black people are not a race. Uh, that that whole idea of race is racism, white supremacy, the entire kind. Dr. Nell Irvin Painter, we spent like 30 minutes talking about that on uh, the program we did with her in 2010. Um, but yeah, and, and so I try to do that, and I feel like. <sighs> I got so many illustrations of that in Invisible Man of the main character attempting to discard the weight of, quote unquote, being black or trying to figure out what that's supposed to mean, trying to get rid of it. And it ended up being black people often who made him take it back, uh, particularly with that bank when he tries to get rid of it the first time mm -hmm. and a black female. And not only does she make him dig it out of the trash, she calls him a nigger. The second time he tries to get rid of it, black person, and she calls him a nigger and she threatens to call white people, the police, to make him pick it back up. Um, the second time he tries to get rid of it, black person picks it up, chases him down, takes it back, gets upset. He calls him a Negro. Doesn't call him a nigger, but he does call him a Negro. And he makes the main character take this minstrel bank back. Uh, and I just I thought that was incredible that it happens the same way both times. They both explicitly label like, bam, you have been stamped nigger. You are not going to escape this. Bam, we're going to make sure that you and the threat of calling white people to make sure that you don't cast off uh, this notion of blackness. Um, I'll just what do, what do you think about that? Um, I think I think you're right. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of, of, of Dr. Painter's work. I use a lot of my classes. Um, and yes, throughout the text, he has certain labels affixed to him by both whites and blacks. And I think it's important. I mean, I, I think it's just genius that you connect uh, the bank to the True Blood episode because they are intimately connected. It's very difficult to make sense of them in some ways um, because why would Mary Rambo, this figure in the text, of a true black woman who understands herself, who understands her heritage, 
who understands black cultural existence, why is it that she has this bank within her boarding house? I mean, this is what the protagonist asks himself when he wakes up after joining the Brotherhood. Why would she keep this image around? Um, and just a, a little background, Ellison actually uh, wrote to a friend that he uh, came up with this idea based on reading Melville's The Confidence Man, and there's a figure in that black guinea who um, really enacts uh, what the bank does, which is opening one's mouth to catch coins uh, thrown um, by white people. Um, however, it's, it's suggested that there's actually, it's actually a white man who's impersonating a black Sambo figure um, who's trying to get money from other folks. So this is what Ellison was basing it on. Um, but this Sambo bank that he ends up carrying around with him in his briefcase that he cannot get rid of, um, you're right, it is, it is one more testament to this idea um, that his racial identity is fixed on him in such a way that he can't get rid of it. But just like the papers that he burns, because remember, he does not empty that briefcase. That briefcase is filled with artifacts that represent other people in positions of power trying to define who he is, right? The piece of paper with his name written on it, his diploma, which is one piece of paper that goes back to what you said in the beginning with Dr. Less's um, statement that this is one more way that society has tried to define success. Um, the Sambo doll that Todd Clifton has sold once he realizes that the Brotherhood is an organization that is not truly invested in seeing African Americans progress, and this bank, all of these things remain in that briefcase. But I think in the end, Ellison wants to suggest that it's the protagonist's responsibility to either accept others defying him or to reject it. Um, and the reason I, I, I feel that way is because Mary Rambo, you might say, well, why does she have this figure? Why does the couple that's evicted, why do they have all these artifacts? Is this really just examples of their own confusion, their own inability to understand their race, to understand their individuality? Um, I would say it's their strength that they're able to understand a certain complexity in their existence that yes, there are moments where they may have exploited themselves, that they may have enacted roles that are demeaning, but that those moments don't deny their humanity. And this is something that I think um, Ellison uh, hammers away at from beginning to end, with the beginning with the old woman who's, who's seeing spiritual. Why is she trying to define freedom? She is someone who has been raped by a white master. Who, whose sons end up killing him. And do you know what she expresses? She expresses ambivalence because it's difficult for her to love her kids and hate him in the way that she thinks she should. And what Ellison wants his protagonist to understand is that ambivalence, uncertainty, contradictory emotions, contradictory images, it's not about getting rid of those. It's about accepting a certain complexity to one's human existence that defines all of us. And I guess um, in many ways, this is what got Ellison in big trouble uh, with black artists, uh, black, um, uh, th those, those writers um, like Addison Gale and, and, and Larry Neal, who changes later, but uh, who we associate with the black arts movement, who were much more radical uh, and politically um, uh, sort of aggressive um, in talking about racism than Ellison was. It's what, these are the things that get him in trouble with that group, I think. Uh, I'm going to save the uh, last 10 minutes to uh, take questions from callers. I just wanted to throw this in because I thought uh, the contrast was just uh, incredible and, and <laughs> I think purposeful. I'll see what you say because I think uh, Ellison does a lot of mocking of religion. Uh, in this book, uh, particularly mm -hmm. Christianity. Um, this passage is 255. You can give us uh, your thought, two-minute thoughts on this, and then I'll go to the phone lines. This is uh, page 255. Uh, Ellison writes, I walked my eyes focused into the endless succession of barbershops, beauty parlors, confectionaries, luncheonettes, fish houses, and hog maw joints, walking close to the windows, the snowflakes lacing swift between, simultaneously forming a curtain, a veil, and stripping it aside. A flash of red and gold 
from a window filled with religious articles caught my eye. And behind the film of frost etching the glass, I saw two brashly painted plaster images of Mary and Jesus surrounded by dream books, love powders, God is love signs, money drawing oil and plastic dice. A black statue of a nude Nubian slave grinned out at me from beneath a turban of gold. I passed on to a window decorated with switches of wiry false hair, ointments guaranteed to produce the miracle of whitening black skin. You, too, can be truly beautiful, a sign proclaimed. Win great happiness with whiter complexion. Be outstanding. In your social set. I just wanted to get two minute thought on this skin whitening being so closely associated with the images of white Jesus and white Mary. Yes, well, again, um, this is the second passage you've read that included the term veil. And for those of us who study African American literature uh, and African American cultural experience, it's impossible to see an author refer to the veil without thinking of Du Bois um, and his interest in the idea uh, that African Americans always see themselves through a veil uh, that is put in place uh, based on the power structure in this country that forces them to see themselves at a point removed. So invisible man, metaphorically, uh, the veil of the snow, right? Um, This is a kind of metaphor for the way that the Harlem community sees itself. Um, And here, I think the contradictory nature of these articles on display in these Harlem stores do not necessarily connote strength. But here, I think you're right, suggests a profound confusion. Um, The desire to whiten one's skin, um, the uh, desire to have uh, both images of Christianity as well as um, Nubian slaves and a suggestion of uh, witchcraft. I don't know if he's so invested in bringing down Christianity here as in pointing out that any people who seem to be at the same time trying to celebrate their heritage through having a a, a black statue of a a Nubian slave, which we can imagine might attest to some sort of, you know, um, black is beautiful belief in, in blackness. Um, that that we would say is self-affirming, but at the same time having fake hair, whitening creams, all these things that are rejection of blackness, um, having them sold in one place, having this idea that people of the Harlem community feel comfortable coming to a store that has all these different kinds of articles. Um, Yes, exactly. Ellison wants to to reject this sense of of confusion over African-American identity. Mm. Wow. Um, I will double check to see if uh, any of the folks that called in, if you all have questions, um, I'll check the talk shoe line first. Um, if you called a person that called in, uh, let's see, person that called in California and the person that called in from Louisiana, uh, do either of you two have a question for Professor Hill? person, uh, California or uh, Louisiana, do either of you two have a question? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm just listening. Oh, okay. Uh, the male, yes, you can be heard. Uh, peace and greetings, Gus and uh, Justice, and uh, thanks for coming on the program, Professor Hill. Uh, I didn't have any questions. Outstanding. Thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. Um, Prism and Ebony News Channel. Did either of you two have questions for Professor Hill? Listening and learning. Thank you. For sure. Ebony News Channel. Blogspot. Uh, Prism, did you have a question? Okay. I will assume she's just listening. Uh, I'll check the. Free HD line uh, 7762-7762. Did you have a question? Seven seven six two. did you have a question? Um, I don't really have a question for Professor Hill, but I don't know if I have a bad connection. You're fading in and out. And the second comment I had, uh, is this the new number because I uh, 
you're not at the context of white pre- supremacy, the old number? Just asking a question. Oh, yeah, no worries. No. <laughs> uh, yes, this is uh, the new number. Um, the, we're not broadcasting at Blog Talk Radio, so that number won't work. Um, we will be broadcasting there uh, on Tuesday, so that number will work then. But uh, we are going to be simulcasting many programs, so this number will work consistently. If you have this one, you can always use this one to dial in. So uh, I, would, I would lock this one. Uh, you can use this one, and you'll always be good. Um, I don't know. Professor Hill, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. I've, I've, had, I've heard some fading, but not, not much. Okay. Okay. Hope, I'll check the audio and uh, see if, you know, it's been uh, an issue. Um, let me double check really quick because I, I also uh, paid attention to the news. Um, this stood out because I knew you were coming on the program. Uh, there was an article on RacismDaily.com. Uh, University of Iowa doesn't take racism seriously, uh, says student. Um, I'll just give folks a little bit of it, and I'm just curious if you had heard about this, if you had any thoughts. Mm -hmm. Uh, It says, University of Iowa student who was the subject of racial slurs last weekend, one of three such incidents originating at a campus dorm, said the university doesn't take discrimination of blacks seriously. As reported earlier, UI officials called the incident isolated, in quotes, and said they are looking into three episodes internally. One of the students, Samantha Royston, a UI sophomore from St. Louis, said she and a friend were returning to Hillcrest Residence Hall at about 2 a.m. Saturday from a black student union event when they heard a male voice shouting from a window. He was shouting, you better keep walking, nigger, said Royston, who filed a police report. Uh, it goes on and said there were some other incidents. Had you heard about all this? And, you know, if so, uh, any thoughts? Yes, yes, I had heard. Um, as I mentioned, I am also a part of African American Studies um, as a program, uh, as well as another organization that my uh, husband is the president of the African American Council, which brings together African American uh, faculty and staff. Um, Both of these organizations, uh, we are very much aware of these incidents and incidents like them in the past um, and have been trying to figure out how we can both um, serve the students who are always our first priority um, when things like this happen, but also um, because to to even put this in a larger context, there was another incident that wasn't racially um, motivated that did get more attention. And so... We've been trying to um, have a conversation and understand why one incident may have received more attention and more action, and these incidents dealing with African-American students experiencing racism on campus have not received uh, the same kind of, of action. Um, so, so I can't say that we've uh, accomplished anything constructive or concrete, I should say, uh, at this moment, but it is something we, we try to very much stay on top of um, any incidents relating to you know, African-American students uh, dealing with, with racism on the campus. Wow. Definitely going to uh, keep my eye on that. That sounds like what I'm saying, racism, white supremacy, total, total world system. Um, we have two minutes left. Um, before, before we wrapped up, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Um, Reading the book this time, I became aware, oh, uh, Ralph Ellison spent some time at Tuskegee Institute. Mm -hmm. And whenever I hear Tuskegee, I think of syphilis experiment. And I'm reading Invisible Man, and before he gives his first speech at the Brotherhood, uh, he sees a person who's suffering from syphilis. And I thought, oh, wow, he was at Tuskegee while that experiment was happening. And... It just it made me think, wow, he was on the operating table and they were experimenting on him and doing all these. I mean, they are talking about giving him a lobotomy and they shock him. I mean, it's it. I hear a lot of echoes of the uh, Tuskegee experiment, unfortunately, in Ellison's work. And I just wanted to maybe get your final thoughts on that. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Ellison was at Tuskegee from 1933 to 1955. Um, this Tuskegee syphilis um, study. Um, occur between 1932 and 1972. So I, I don't know if he would have been aware. I mean, that would 
you know, he would have been there very, very early on before many of us understood uh, exactly what was going on with this, with this experiment. But in general, what I can say confidently is that Ellison um, did not look upon Tuskegee and, quite frankly, HBCUs. Um, more broadly in very positive terms. He often thought <clears throat> that they were not as aggressive in dealing with issues and uh, in, in, in really getting the students prepared to enter into um, a world where race was going to be an issue that defined them. He thought that in many ways the kind of traditional uh, 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 plan of study that many of these schools embraced at this moment in the 30s and the 40s was not progressive enough. So Ellison, um, while I don't know if he would have been, um, you know, knowledgeable of the syphilis experiment, was not uh, an advocate of Tuskegee, um, or he, he talked some letters in somewhat disparaging terms about other HBCUs as well, because he really thought they were just too conservative, to, to be frank. Hmm. Oh, I, I, I totally agree. I don't think... Um that Mr. Ellison was aware of what was happening with the syphilis study, but I think, I don't think he would have been surprised right. that that yeah. sort of thing could happen. Yeah. And I, especially given what you just said, I think he would have had a mild chuckle, unfortunately, that this happened on the campus of an HBCU. Man, <laughs> um, right. I don't right. think he would have been surprised at all. And that came through big time in the book, just uh, the scene after at Liberty Paints. I mean, that that is the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, Liberty Paints, <laughs> right there. Um, well, like I said, I, even though we didn't have total agreement, your, your book, <laughs> man, it, uh, I will be way more aggressive uh, in the way that I talk about Ellison because it's – I looked at the cover – I have the, somebody bought me a copy of this book. I didn't even ask for it, but I got a copy. And I, and I think that speaks to the brilliance because he says some extraordinary things in this book, things that I think a lot of people, if this was not fiction, I don't think he could have got this book published if he had said some of the things that are in this book. Um, and it's easily available. I didn't even ask for a copy because it's so easy to get your hands on a copy of this mm -hmm. book, which I think mm -hmm. just – speaks again to his brilliance that a black person could get a book out like this with some of the things that are in it that white people around the world love and say it's one of the best books ever. Uh, it's just, man, extraordinary. Um, but I will be much more aggressive. Uh, I have the, uh, the hardback uh, edition and the cover jacket. It has, uh, I think, a black male on the cover with one eye and uh, it looks to me like a scope from a gun. And I said, that is the public enemy logo. That is the black male in the crosshairs. Um, I don't know. Uh, do, are you familiar with the cover image that I'm talking about? I think so. It's not the cover image I have. Um, Ellison himself played around with certain ideas um, for the cover, and many of them um, did uh, have a kind of reminiscence with that, exactly what you're saying. And you're right. I mean, this book, when it was published in 1953, it didn't just – you know, get good reviews. It won the National Book Award. Um, so he really was a trailblazer in bringing issues of race to the fore, um, such that huge, huge numbers of people read it, talked about it, um, were forced to, to deal with these issues. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, University of Iowa, uh, Professor Lena Hill, uh, you have a book about to come out, is that correct? I, I do, hopefully. Um, my book is going to be entitled Visualizing Blackness and the Creation of the African American Literary Tradition. And it really begins with Phyllis Wheatley at the end of the 18th century and ends with Ralph Ellison. So it covers almost uh, 200 years of African American literature um, as well as uh, visual art. So excited about that. Wow. And that should be out this year? No, it will not be out this year. Okay. Um, I'm not. I, I'm not sure when it will. As far as an exact date. Okay. We will be on the lookout. Um, non Mighty Wick, you didn't have any questions, correct? Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you so much for uh, sharing a bit of your Sunday evening with us. Uh, I learned a ton, and uh, we will definitely be on the lookout for more of your work. Uh, please read Ralph Ellison. Um, I just, man, it's one of my favorite books, and uh, Professor Hill's work. Uh, it, it, it helped me get a better understanding of why this is one of my favorite books. Well, thank you again for having me on the program. I very much enjoyed it. 
for sure. Uh, we will keep an eye on your work, and uh, thank you for sharing some of your evening. Uh, take excellent care, and uh, <laughs> I will, I'll be uh, on the lookout for what happens with uh, the incidents uh, that were reported about uh, University of Iowa, the, uh, the news articles. I'll be uh, on the lookout for that as well. All right. Take good care. You too. Good evening. Bye-bye. Context of white supremacy, uh, Gus T. Renegade and Justice. Um, I really hope folks will, will read Invisible Man. Um, I think if you have an understanding of white supremacy and you read this book, so many things will jump out at you. I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible, <laughs> incredible. Um, at any rate, and we did two programs on it, so, you know, if anyone, anything, if you, you think my views on racism uh, are constructive or what have you, uh, this book had a big impact on my thinking. It's one of my top five books uh, of all time. I'm really glad I have my own copy. This book is almost 600 pages, and I don't remember how many times I've read it cover to cover. Invisible Man. At any rate, um, let's see, I will... Uh, I will, I guess, take a commercial, and then I'll check to see if anyone on the phone lines has anything they would like to share, and uh, we'll see uh, if Justice has a news report. If she does, we'll hear hers. If not, I'll give one, and uh, yeah, then I'll check the phone lines. So we'll be right back. Context of white supremacy. <laughs> Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. RacismDaily.com, your number one source for global news reports on race, racism, and overt actions of white supremacy. From Asia to the Americas to Europe to Australia to Africa, racism is not a thing of the past. It is our current reality. Be informed. Be globally informed. You should be the first to know. RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com, RacismDaily.com. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Do you need a one-stop shop for all of your multimedia needs? Triumphant Multimedia is a skilled team of professionals with a passion for great marketing and chic design. Our specialties include consulting, brand development, copywriting, and creative graphic design that's second to none. We also offer photography, photo retouching, videography, and video editing. At Triumphant Multimedia, our goal is to provide highly effective creative solutions built to suit any individual need or budget. Give us a call at 678-732-8067 or check us out online at TRI Multimedia. Multimedia.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the cows. This is Justice here at Block Talk Radio. If you want to learn, listen, understand, and question, go to blocktalkradio.com slash victim dash of dash racism. And for more information on racism and white supremacy, go to my blog, justdojusticetoday.blogspot.com. My email address is justice.asap at yahoo.com. Replace white supremacy with justice, ASAP. 
you're just saying just buckets and buckets of words. Our people, our people, our people are, 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 are very serious, serious about, about not being, about being very serious. serious. Context of white supremacy. Um, again, I hope folks will read uh, Invisible Man. Uh, Justice, if you are there, uh, did you get a news article for the program? I'm sorry, I I, I can't really hear you because my uh, my phone is uh, it's beeping. So, uh, can you please repeat that again? <laughs> um, I said, uh, did uh, if uh, do you have a news article uh, for the program? Yes, yes, I do. Um, this news article was from RacismDaily.com. It was published on April 30th to of this year. Uh, what that was? Yesterday. So, yeah, yesterday. And the title is New York Teen Admits to Shooting Classmate Because He Was Black. There's a photo below the title, and um, this uh, article was, I believe, under, I think it was either study or education or economics. It was either one of those. Um, so on Friday afternoon, a teenager from from Cooper from Cooperstown, town, New York, admitted in court that the reason he chased down a fellow classmate and shot him was because that teen that teen is black. Anthony Par Par Cheryl, now 17, was just 16 last April 2nd. When he stopped his vehicle right next to the baseball hall of fame in in Co-Oper Town, got out with his rifle in hand and chased fellow 16-year-old Co-Oper Town High School student Wesley lit it into the Co-Oper Town Police Station. Parcheral shot at Lippitt twice, hitting him once. Then he turned the rifle on himself, shooting himself in the chin. Both boys survived and both were in court Friday afternoon. The courtroom was packed with family members and more than a dozen classmates sitting behind each teen in support. Odds ago, County Court Judge Brian Burns denied request to videotape the proceedings, but partial, but Patro told the judge, I shot Mr. Lippitt because he was African American. Members of Partrell's family shouted, that's a lie, and was even thrown out of court from, for his outburst. The Patrell's believe Otsago County District Attorney John Mule forced the team to say 11 years Instead of the possible 25 to life, Neil said the evidence showed the attack was racially motivated, and he wanted Patrell to admit it in order to get the lead deal of attempted murder in the second degree instead of attempted murder in the second degree committed as a hate crime. So. Although he didn't plead guilty to the hate crime, he did he did admit in court his reason for targeting Olympic was because of race. Mule says the evidence of racism stemmed from a statement Parchell gave police after the incident, as well as a diary Patrell wrote in that was turned over to the authorities by Patrell is due in court on July 22nd, where he will sentence to 11 years in state prison. And um, that news article was from RacismDaily.com, and yeah. Uh, I read uh, I read that report yesterday. I thought that was. Uh... That was interesting. They made a deal with this white person um, 
to admit in court that, you know, he tar he, he shot this person because they were black specifically. Um, but they did not charge him with that. I thought that was that was interesting. Um yeah, explicit oh. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> Oh no, I didn't read it on the program. Sorry, I, oh. to be clear, I didn't read it on the program. I just I read it privately, um, and yeah, yeah, I didn't. You, you were you were great. You were great. Kudos. Um, yeah, I just I read it privately, and uh, I, I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, that's got to be on alert. I think Professor Hill said that got to be on alert. I mean, <laughs> these white people uh, they are out to get. As Ellison said, these white people are out to get you if you are a black person, non-white person. Did you have, what did you think about that report? Very interesting because um, a white person shot a, not, shot a black person just because of his, just because he was black. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Um, it doesn't seem like to me that this white person um, was refined. I would agree. I would agree. Definitely not refined uh, racist man, um, you know, which which is why, you know, white people will will uh, he's he's getting in trouble with other white people. Uh, you're supposed to uh, supposed to be much more refined in the way that you practice racism uh, in 2011. Wow. Yeah, I believe he did get in trouble. Um, uh, he uh, it says in the article that um, he will be uh, he will be. Um, in uh, state prison for 11 years. You you will get in. Tr I've said that all along uh, for the people who say that, you know, white people are ignorant about racism. If you are a white person, a part of your duties uh, is that you are supposed to be informed about racism. Uh, that's that's just the part of your responsibilities as racist man, racist woman. And if you are not informed about white supremacy as a white person, you will get in trouble with other white people. Uh, and we've even had white people who've came on the program and shared that. Uh, Ariella Gross, uh, that would be one. But yeah, consistently, um, you know, th just keep that in mind. Uh, you can't be ignorant about racism if you're a white person. You will get in trouble with other white people. Uh, and I would say at this point, uh, if you're not being refined in the way you practice racism, you might get in trouble with other white people, more powerful white people. That's true, and um, and it also shows a picture of him, you know, getting carried to jail in the car. So, yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I'm glad you shared that one. I thought that was I thought that was uh, quite significant uh, as well. Um, do you have anything else uh, you wanted to? Oh, I had something I wanted to ta to talk about. But did you have anything else you wanted to share? Um. Yes, um, I found out that the news article um, is um, is exactly under education. Oh, that's good to know. That's, okay, that's good to know. Um, and yeah. other ones too. Oh yeah, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's unfortunately a whole lot of them. Um, I believe uh, Yalo uh, Momodu, I believe his report is under education there as well. So. Um, he was our guest earlier, uh, I guess last Tuesday. Um, yeah. Any anything else, uh, Justice? Um, I do need to fix my commercial. <laughs> that that's one thing that I really need to do is I need to fix my commercial. Do. But besides that, I don't have anything else. Hmm. Were you aware of the American Girl doll? Did you know about that? Have you seen those before? Uh, no, <laughs> no. Um, I'm. I grabbed all, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. I've I've never heard of that before. Oh. Never heard of that. I'm looking at it now, and uh, I don't really know what to say. Like, uh, it's like a runaway slave doll. Um. Like I don't, I don't really know what to, I, I was thinking. Do they have a white American girl doll that is a slave owner? 
Like that would be interesting, you know, and, and that would be, you know, correct. If we're shooting for historical accuracy, that would be correct. So there should be some white slave owner dolls with a whip uh, and a bill of sales. You know, <laughs> like, do they have that? Um, I, I highly doubt that they do. But um, I, I mean, this I don't what do you think about? That? <laughs> do you think uh, what do you think about them having a, a runaway slave doll? Um, I think it supports racism and it's making fun of black people. Um, how, where did you find? I typed in American Girl dolls. Uh, is that what you did, or I I went. What did you do? I went to Google dot com and I searched for American Girl doll Addie. I just put all that in Addie A D as in domination A D D Y. And then I clicked on uh, images at the top. Abby? Ad- Addy. A D D Y. Okay. okay. Yeah. D is in dog. Um, so yeah, I put that in, and then I clicked on images, and it gives you pictures. Like you can you can see what she looks like. She's got you know, <laughs> she's like a runaway slave doll. So I don't know. Like that it's, is so interesting. <laughs> it's almost giving wow, me a headache to look wow, at. Wow, that is so interesting. <laughs> I uh, man. I'm looking at it, and and it's like. Like um, it it um, a runaway slave really. <laughs> wow, that's very interesting. <laughs> I've never heard. Of, I'm curious of people that called in. Have you heard of this? I mean, uh, man, I didn't even know how to respond. <laughs> she said she, man, I don't, I don't. It's man, it's uh, making me nauseous. I'm feeling like precious again. Um, I just I want to know if they have a counterpart. Like, do they have a slave? A white American, what is it, American, uh, I had to move the image, Amer- American Girl Doll. Do they have a white one uh, that's a slave owner? Like, that would be accurate. If they're shooting for historical accuracy, okay, but there should be a white slave owner doll too, right? And if they don't have that, then I'm just curious as to why they've got, what the constructive value of a runaway slave doll is. Like, that is that is escaping me <laughs> right now. Um yeah. <laughs> Do you have any other thoughts on that, Justice? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I just said. Do you, Do you have any other uh, any other thoughts on the on the slave runaway slave doll or? Um, I looked and I'm scrolling and I'm scrolling and I and I own well and um, I do see some white American girl dolls, but they are they're not um they're not um. They are not runaway slaves. What are they? Um, they're uh, white, and they don't look like they're slaves. Do they have an occupation? Like, does it say? <laughs> I mean, um, I don't believe so. But it does say American Girl doll. Wow, oh, I'm uh. Well, on one, on one of them it says Rebecca. But uh, yeah, that's it. Hmm. Man, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to uh, to take some time looking at this, man. This white people stay on their job. White people stay on their job. Um. Man, I'm uh, I'm curious. I'll hit the phone lines to see if anyone, if you all have heard of this, if you know anything about it, uh, if you have thoughts on it. Uh, I'm very I'm very curious. I'll go to the phone lines um, for the folks who called in. Uh, California, Louisiana, Prism, Ebony News Channel. If your line is open and you don't want to talk, you can just say, you know, this is California. I don't want to talk, and I can mute you. But your lines are open. Have are any of you all familiar with this American Girl doll? I have heard of it, and I think when I saw it, it was actually on the Oprah Winfrey show. I think they were doing the show on toys, if I remember correctly, and each doll is supposed to have her own story. And I'm pretty sure with Oprah Winfrey loving dolls that they highlighted that doll on her show. What's her name? Haddad? Patty or Maddie? Addie. Addie. Yeah, I think it was on Oprah Winfrey show. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I'm on their page. So the one doll that looks white, Molly McIntyre. 
Molly McIntyre is growing up during World War II. She wants the war to end so that her dad can come home from overseas. With her English friend Emily at her side, Molly learns the importance of pulling together, just as her country must do to win the war. Hmm, that's... I don't know. <laughs> like that, uh, that seems very different from slave. I, I don't, my dad is fighting in the war on the winning side, and... I, I don't know. This is. Uh, I, are any of the other callers? Are you familiar with this? Do you know about this? Well, I've never seen the. Uh, I've never seen the doll. Uh, yeah, that's funny though. Um, hmm, that's funny. I, I should pick those up and hand them out around Christmas. Birthday too. I want. I mean, I want a slave doll. I'm sorry for interrupting. That's what I'm. That's what I'm saying. I want one of those. Uh, distressed Negro girl dolls. That that sounds um that's that's a trip how they did it though, how it's like we don't have to prove that we had owned slaves. You already know we owned you, so you know what we did, so they don't have to go out of their way to describe what they're doing because we kinda already know what they're doing. The little girls already saying, I'm waiting on my dad to get home you know. Everyone even they even said even the uh orphan got what, forty acres of mule and a uh, black, so you know what they were doing already. They already own the slaves. It seems like to me. I I mean, <laughs> I I misspoke. I uh, I don't want the slave doll. I want the slave owner doll. Um, I think that you know would be correct. If there's going to be a slave doll, then you've got to have some. There's a re, there's a person responsible for this person being enslaved. So you know. That doll should exist. If that doesn't exist, I'm real. I, I'm thinking that is real non-constructive. Uh, that's the only. If that's, I don't know how many uh, black dolls they have, but if the only black doll they have is a runaway slave, man. Um, <clears throat> White people usually are not honest enough to implicate themselves in the things they've done, but they don't mind reminding the victims that they are victims and subjects. Because I, I just think about there's an American uh, girl store. Um, I think in L.A., probably at the Grove, which is like in the Fairfax district. It's just south of Hollywood. I'm thinking if I was a little black girl and my mother took me into that store to buy a doll, how horrible I would feel if I went in there and saw that slave doll. And even if there was a slave owner doll, she's going to be in beautiful, pretty clothes. Her hair is going to be in those Scarlet O'Hara coiled curls and she's going to be neat and pretty while the doll that looks like me is going to be, you know, in a burlap sack dress or something with some handkerchief on her head and the story of, you know, struggle and victimization. But, you know, probably no, no American girl doll that looks like me that is African and has culture and a history of, you know, of, of her people's traditions. Usually, usually I, it, it's rare for it to be balanced like that. Yeah, I didn't uh I I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't really know what to say. I just wasn't I wasn't prepared for runaway slave doll <laughs> that uh I, I didn't ha I didn't know that was in the cards. Um man, it just I just don't see the constructive value of it. I would I would need someone to explain, you know, what what is constructive about having a runaway slave especially if we're not gonna have the slave owner doll. Um they I'll I'll this will be the I'm sorry, this will, this will be the last one I'll read, and I'll, I'll mute my line. They have uh, Rebecca Rubin. As a girl growing up in New York City in 1914, Rebecca celebrates treasured traditions passed down through her Russian Jewish family. With a little creativity, Rebecca learns how to stay true to her heart as she follows her dreams in the big city. I am muted. Gus, you went out for a minute like you were muted. I didn't hear the full description of the doll. Oh, dang. Uh, Rebecca Rubin, uh, as a girl growing up in New York City in 1914, 
Rebecca celebrates treasured traditions passed down through her Russian Jewish family. With a little creativity, Rebecca learns how to stay true to her heart as she follows her dreams in the big city. That's the end. Well, see, there should also be a, a doll, I, at least have a doll that's, you know, made it through something, maybe through the, the, mid, the mid-20th century or something, have a black but, but, you know, her family also kept some traditions and, you know, she's going for her freedom too and, and rights or something, but slavery, I, I hope that's not it. I believe when I when I watched the Oprah Winfrey show, uh, they said that their idea with these dolls was to give each of them a story of something she went through and overcame, or you know something that shows that they're strong characters or something like that. And I I believe they have books that go along with the dolls, if I'm not mistaken. That seems to be correct from what I'm seeing. But I mean, you you couple that with movies like Imagine That that the children reviewed yesterday. And I mean, it. you really do have to be very careful with what you allow your children to watch and have because it's so refined. And we get excited usually as black people just to see anything that has features like us or a color like us, even like, you know, with Princess and the Frog. And meanwhile, they're presenting your children with the idea that the villain or evil people are black and dark and black girls don't have fathers because they die early, and and white people, you know, have the money, so you go to them to get the money, and then when they cheat you, some prince who's also not black comes along and makes all your dreams come true, and then you get to upgrade by marrying him. But nobody black could really help you do anything. To me, I just see a lot of racism, white supremacy, and the princess and the frog as well. But it's very much more refined programming, and we just we don't get it because we don't want to be truthful about the, the world that we're living in and that racism, white supremacy still exists. And it, it's sad. It's very sad. Um, my daughter, I have a daughter. She's 21. Um that happened to her. I was, uh, I didn't pay attention. I let her watch TV. She could have a pocket TV if she wanted it. I didn't care. But what I noticed by the time she turned maybe two or three, she said, I want to be white like big girls don't cry. And that was maybe back then a commercial uh, catered to Caucasian girls, maybe the No More Tears Johnson commercial. And, you know, they always advertise white is perhaps to her great and beautiful. So, then she said, I don't like the black one. And I'm like, you don't like the black one? I don't, you know, I don't like the black one. You know, and then I'm trying to figure out well, what's going on. And then it's the television because I don't have Caucasian friends. I was like, it's the television. But I never stopped to turn it off until I had my son. Then it's like, oh, no television. It sends subliminal messages. But with my daughter, I let the television just corrupt her. So it is true that those programs, commercials, all of that is geared towards making Black not want to be black, or blacks hate themselves, and Caucasians, yeah, way to go, you know, that kind of thing, to me. And you know what? I was in Walmart the other day, and I took a trip down the the aisle with all the dolls, and I actually did find more black dolls than I'm used to seeing in, in the stores, but I noticed that with the exception of one or two dolls, virtually all of the black female dolls had straight, stringy hair. And I'm thinking, while it's good that they have black dolls, still that's going to program little black girls who play with those dolls to think the ideal for them is that they should have straight, stringy hair like white people, and that's still damaging. I mean, that, that's still the standard is hair. That's not our hair. So everywhere that they look, even in the programming and the advertising, you're sold that the ideal of happiness, glamour, femininity, having it all is still white. Now, they'll, they'll throw in some non-white people every now and then, but that's the, the white supremacist message is still so dominant. And, and visual messages are very powerful for children. 
and for adults too, but specifically for children. I, I think it might be constructive for parents if you have programs you approve of your children watching or movies or anything like that to get DVDs or VHS tapes if you still have those. Put on them what you approve of them watching. It won't have to have any commercials on it, and that's what they watch, no cable, you know, that they can just flip through and see what they want on their own, and that's that, and protect them from, you know, that mass marketing. I also suggest watching a documentary. You can find it on a Google video called Century of the Self, and it, it tells the story of how this massive advertising and programming and uh, subliminal brainwashing to get you wanting things you don't need and the idea of excess and focus on self came to be. And uh, it was done by Sigmund Freud's nephew. It, it's kind of long, so it might take you a couple of days to watch it if you can't sit down for about three to four hours, but it's still very constructive. Oh, another one's called Consuming Kids. That deals with advertising and programming children. Uh, Neely Fuller, uh, he'll be on the program uh, tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific, uh, Neely Fuller, Jr., his uh, 13th visit. Gus, are we ever going to be able to find uh, his seventh visit to the cow? Um... <laughs> uh, I uh I mean it's not that difficult to find. Like uh it's not that difficult to find. I think uh if you really wanted to find it, you, you can find it. I uh I think I said some time ago that would be like a uh what do they call those? Um a tra scavenger, uh, hunt. scavenger hunt, yes. It'll be like a counter racist scavenger hunt to see if you can find uh episode seven. Um I don't 'cause I don't think it's that difficult to find. Like I've you know Attempted to do so myself, and it didn't. It didn't take a lot of effort. So yeah, it's I googled not... seventh visit, and I didn't get anything. <laughs> will it? Will it have the cows in the title? It'll be blatant. It'll be. It'll be really blatant. It'll be you know like a typical uh, program description uh, for the cows. I haven't been able to find it, and I've looked for it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, yeah, <laughs> what you could do, what you could do, <laughs> what you could do, what you could do, um, you could, I'm sure, because a lot of people do have it. Like a lot of people have it. Uh, it was uh, public. Uh, and when I say public, it's still public. Uh, it was easily accessible on the blog talk page for a time, mm -hmm. uh, and people did get it. So I'm sure, even you know, if you just make an appeal right now, uh, someone might even email it to you. Um, you know, within 24 hours, you know, if you have an email address. Ebony, Ebony News Channel at gmail.com. You want to say it one more time, Slow? <laughs> Ebony News Channel at gmail.com. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. She would like it. I'm sure someone out there listening has the seventh visit, and, you know, they can email it to you. Well, if uh, folks don't have anything else to share, uh, I will prepare for Mr. Fuller. Um, we will be on Blog Talk. The number for Blog Talk, it'll work, white people permitting. Uh, it'll work, and we'll be broadcasting, simulcasting there on Tuesday. Um, as I said, um, the admitted racist Gretna Blast um, followed through and uh, got a phone for Gus T. Renegade. Um, and I thought, I mean, it's just so many things about that I think are worthy of being explained within the context of white supremacy. So that'll be Tuesday. But Mr. Fuller is up first uh, Monday. That would be May 2nd, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, I want also to uh, admitted white supremacist Dr. Martin Kevorkian um, suggested Professor Hill and uh, – I do think she had very constructive uh, information. I really enjoyed reading Ellison. Uh, again, I got a ton from it. And uh, the True Blood incident, I don't know if people have, have read the book or not, but 
Um, True Blood, again, he uh, has blackmail. He has incest, uh, has sex with his daughter. And the black people at the HBCU, they're trying to get rid of him. They don't want him around. They're trying to get him to move away. He goes and tells white people what he did, and they give him money. They help him. And, I mean, this is in the book where True Blood says, you know, white people bend over backwards to help him once they find out what he's done. And uh, I think that just that speaks volume uh, to the system of racism, white supremacy, uh, supporting, doing anything they can uh, to aid uh, degenerate black behavior, particularly anything around sexual confusion. Want to promote that, want to have plenty of it, <laughs> anything uh, anti-sexual behavior, anything like that, plenty of it. We want that around. We'll make sure that uh, this person has no problems at all. Um, yeah, I mean, it's right in the book, and early in the book, too. Um, I will check the person that dialed in. North Georgia, uh, the person dialed in North Georgia, did you have anything you wanted to share, or are you just listening? Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm just listening right now. I'm just catching up. Oh, okay. <laughs> right on. Um, yeah, if anybody else, uh, unless you had something to share, uh, we'll get ready to prep for tomorrow's program, um, unless you all have something to share. Ebony, um, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, uh, uh, you were looking for the um, Neely Fuller program? Cause that's yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, Gus, I thought we were supposed to be uh, helping victims. <laughs> um. I think uh, <laughs> I think uh, you should give it to her because you know we're trying to replace white supremacy with justice uh, as soon as possible. Hmm. Duly noted. All right, justice. <laughs> I think that's kind of rude, though. <laughs> Duly we're, noted. We're supposed to be helping victims. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> Good looking to help justice. I have a share. It's not a share. It's just something I I I want to say. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. This is my first time calling, and I want to thank you guys for doing the children's show. I thought that was kind of clever because it kind of helps. Well, at least my son uh, when he, when he's trying to listen to the program to hear the children because I tell him, you see, justice. He doesn't drive around. She's serious, you know, so I'll, I'll use that as an example. And then when you have the children on, like it was a time before it was a, a several other children, it kind of makes him think, oh, well, that means me too. So it, it's so he doesn't bump his head or when I'm saying something, it's not like you're the only one in the world because I'm basically the only one in the world saying what I say. And then when he's in school, it's like, oh, oh. What's going on? Should I adapt or should I, you know, kind of do what my mom is telling me? And then when you guys have the children's program, they can kind of release or say whatever it is in their little world, how they experience it. So, thank you. You should have him, you know, call in. Um, we plan to do more of them. Um You know, you should have him call in. We would love to hear from him. In fact, if he, you know, has a oh, film... Okay. He called yesterday. Oh, okay. Okay, right on. Yeah, um, yeah. we would love to have him back on. Like, uh, if he has, I think I told him yesterday, if he has, you know, a film or a book that, you know, he thinks it would be constructive for us to check out and discuss, you know, we'll do it. Just let us know. No, what was funny, I'm listening because I, I wasn't where he was. I was listening online, and he's calling the guy, the gay guy. I'm like, oh, my God, hi, gay. You can't just say that. He's a gay guy. I'm like, you could have remembered his name. His name wasn't the gay guy. He had a name. But I just thought that was like, oh, because he connected that disgrace with him being gay. He had to be gay. So, yeah, that was, oh, thank you. You guys are great. That was cool. Yay. <laughs> uh, we we enjoyed hearing from him. He took great notes on Imagine That. It seemed like he really paid close attention, and, and he noted the incorrect behavior of the black male uh, with the lipstick. That is uh, A+. plus. Well done. Job well done with the parenting. Thank you. Thank you. Now he's watching the Jackson 5 cartoon because I guess that was a lot. <laughs> so he's watching 
remember the cartoons we used to watch with Jackson 5? So he has like maybe 25 of those downloaded on DVD. So he's just in that. Mm, wow. <laughs> that's probably interesting to watch given everything that's happened. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it is. It's, it's it, well. It's actually refreshing because when he when it, it's it's a little it's more calm in versus what they put out for the children now. You know, it's kind of like a unity with the brothers, not like anything you'll see in the cartoons these days. If you even catch five or six blacks in one setting, so you know you get that PJs like a party kind of low income super that kind of thing. That's as much as you'll get, or the boondogs. In which you get half of this, a piece of this, a piece of this, and it's all confusing. So that it was more calm, the Jackson. I have to watch. Uh, I have to watch some of those episodes. Um, be interesting to see what kind of materials there. Huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it'll take you back, back to back to the seventies, and forward. Father. Yeah, it, it's funny. Um, we have anything else? Anyone online? Anything else they want to uh, get out before uh, the program concludes? I definitely want to encourage um, having more children's programs. Uh, I think it's really good, um, very constructive. We definitely need more young people to get comfortable. We need non-white people to get comfortable talking about racism, like, immediately. Um, and, and I mean that in every way. Like, I mean, today, we need to be doing things, taking steps today to become better at communicating uh, effectively, efficiently, accurately uh, about racism, white supremacy, um, and, you know, in terms of age-wise, um, not waiting until people are 25, 30, 20, trying to get them informed about racism. We need to, you know, be doing this from <laughs> conception. Um, so, yeah, uh, definitely, if there are non-white children out there, if you know of non-white children, try to see if they would be interested in participating. Um, you know, you can tell them, hey, if you have a film – that you like, you know, they would probably be willing to discuss it. If you have a film or a book that you really like, you know, they would probably be okay with talking about it, uh, particularly if, you know, it's any movies that they think um, might have some racism in it. You know, we, we are definitely open to that. Um, I don't know. Justice, did you did you have in mind uh, if you wanted to do another children's program anytime? Um, I don't, well... I do want to do another children's program, but um, I don't have any. any uh, and I, I don't have a movie or anything in mind. Okay. Well, I guess if you can think about uh, a movie or a book uh, or anything else, you know, that you would like to focus on and a date and time. Uh, and let us know, and we'll set up the next one because uh, I think it's constructive, and I think other victims uh, have expressed that they think it's constructive too. So, um, yeah, if you can think of something and a date and time, uh, we'll get the next children's program set up. Okay. Uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow, Neely Fuller Jr., 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, the program, it'll be available for download here, and I'll also make a link at Blog Talk, so this will be available for download. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, support the wish list, Amazon.com. It's under Gus T. Renegade, and uh, invest if you think the program is constructive. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, support Cree and the good folks at Reckless 2.0 as well. Uh, we'll be back uh, tomorrow, May 2nd. Uh, replace white supremacy with justice immediately and for sure read ralph ellison um it is an incredible book i i definitely am about not wasting time i think if you are a black person and you are interested at all in racism you will really enjoy ralph ellison you'll learn you'll learn a ton uh context of white supremacy signing out